Porsche All-Star Series with five more exciting challenges left for our intrepid influencers to face. And the first five rounds of the championships, we've had four different winners. Emily Jones, Dan Suzuki, Matt Campbell, Gabriella Jakova. Actually, we had five because you had Pierre Oliver Vallette as well winning races. Emily has a 38 point lead in the championship right now, but we'll talk more about that in a moment. Second half of the season, we are going to go to some of the most famous racetracks in the world. Spa in Belgium, the Nordschleifer in Germany, Circuit de la Sarpe in France and Monza in Italy. Today, however, we say bienvenue à Quebec as we welcome you to Montreal and, of course, the famous circuit Gilles Villeneuve as we finish up our run of races in the Porsche 718 Cayman GT4. And with that, we welcome you along to our coverage across both Porsche and iRacing's online media channels. I'm Will Vincent. I'm glad to be back with you. And I'm joined, as ever, by a bona fide Canadian esports legend, Sadakis, Matt Trivet, call him what you will. Matt, it's great to be back with you. Yeah, and great to have you back as well. Um, you're absolutely right. We're here at Circuit de Juvenneuve. Uh, I'll say it the full French way. Um, but yeah, Montreal, famous track for Formula One, but Porsche Cup has raced here many times in the past as well. And it's always an absolute treat. Very, very close walls in proximity to the track. So I'm sure we'll see a bit of drama today, but definitely a challenge no matter what car we're in. And it is the Cayman, which is the momentum car as we've been dubbing it over the three. So um, gonna be very interesting to see how people handle themselves in it. Let's look at the upcoming rounds of the championship. We've ticked off five already at Interlagos, Barcelona, Imola, Silverstone, and Road Atlanta. As I said, this is the last of our three races in the 718 Cayman GT4 CS. After this round, we're gonna have three races in the 911 RSR car. They're gonna be at Spa, Nürburgring, and Le Mans. Momentum's been the factor of the day. You're right, Matt, in this Cayman GT4, in two weeks' time, these influencers and, of course, the Porsche work drivers, they've got to get used to another challenge in that 911 RSR. Yeah, and it's it's such a stark difference. Yes, they're all Porsches. They all have similarities. Look, they've all got four wheels and an engine, but they're all very different in the way that they drive as well. Going from the Cayman, it's the least powerful, very fast car in its own right, but very power, the least powerful of the three, going to a very powerful high downforce RSR, essentially a GTE machine. Uh, is going to be a huge difference, but for a track like Spa, it's going to be great because that, that lap is, I think, better in a faster car. Um, the faster you go around Spa, the, the, the more exciting the track feels to me. And then a track like Nürburgring, I want that downforce. In fact, I'd rather be in the Cayman and go slow and steady or in the RSR than the Cup car. I think the Cup car around the Nordschleife is, a, is one of the toughest challenges in all of iRacing. And of course, our pro sim racers they are going to be doing that in a few weeks time as part of the porsche tag Heuer esports supercut by iRacing. we've got the race format for those of you who may be new to the series along the bottom of your screen right now 10 minutes of qualifying that's coming up very very soon then a 17 minute sprint race followed by 22 minutes in our feature race and of course if you are new to the series as well don't go anywhere after this, the All-Star Series, because, of course, coverage of the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup by iRacing follows immediately after our set of races to start the afternoon. And, Matt, let's talk about this track very quickly. Yes. Um, we'll do a full track map a little bit later on, but this track, it's fast. It's also narrow. It's got that street circuit feel to it. So little well, room for error. Yeah, well, and technically speaking, it is a temporary yeah. road circuit. Despite that it is built as a permanent facility, it's near downtown Montreal, so they don't actually get to use it all year. In fact, they're only allowed two weekends of noise per year for racing use. Uh, formerly NASCAR IndyCar took over the other from the Formula One Grand Prix weekend, but it sits for a lot of the year, and it's actually Parc Jean Drapeau is the two islands of Ville Notre Dame, man-made islands side by side. So public people, you get a lot of cyclists, a lot of walkers, runners out there. You don't see a lot of racing outside of the two race weekends. One, as it is most recently. Yeah. And of course, in 1999, uh, the final corners, turn 13, turn 14, they got themselves a new name, the War of the Champions. And it's one that's stuck for, what, 22 years since then. Um, and the thing about that final, that final chicane isn't the chicane itself. 
it's the kind of sleeping policeman curbs on the kind of just on the inside of each of the apexes of the corner and of course that very big concrete barrier on the outside of 14. Yeah, and you're right. The, the, the wall on the outside is not the problem in itself. It's that they put those policemen in for a reason, those sausage cribs, because it's, it's a very easy corner to cut. Um, and oftentimes you clip. Typically, the second one leads to the disaster. Uh, and, and that, you know, you, you get a little bit of air into the car, you land, it overloads tires, boom, back end steps around and you're into the wall very quickly. We've seen people kiss the wall and get away with it on just as many occasions. But more famously, we've seen a lot of champions, Michael Schumacher, Jacques Villeneuve, uh, Fernando Alonso, I think, has been in that wall. I think he kissed it and got away with it in, I want to yeah. say, six when he won the race. Um, but there's been a lot of big names. I think even maybe Hakkinen was in that wall at one point in time. But everyone's everyone's been there. Um, and every year, it's a waiting game of who's going to be the next driver to hit it. It's not a matter of if, but when. So I'm sure we'll see someone touch that today. Oh, most certainly. And one thing as well, just your little fun facts of the day. This track... Um, has actually played host to the most watched motor race of all time. That was all the way back in 2005. You you made the interesting caveat. It was on, you know, the time of day. It's a perfect time for Canada and the North American region. Prime time in Europe, but this racetrack does yeah, have but I think, a distinctive. Uh, well, I think I think it, I think the fair point is to say that Canada is the home of racing now. That's yeah. There you go. We are the motor racing home for the entire world. I knew it all along, but uh, I've just been waiting for people to realize it. You just see that up the top of your screen. Seven minutes remaining in qualifying. Let's get you some on-track action, shall we? And where better to start than with the number 51 car, the lady who is leading the championship right now. And we were just talking off air as well, Matt, about the fact that normally when we talk about, you know, car colors, we've always had the red, the blacks, and the whites as one combo. We've always had the blues and the whites and the grays. This season, it's all about the lime green. The person leading the way in the championship is in one of these mint green cars. Oh. It's a big chunk, a big chunk there of the curb on the exit of 14. Emily Jones coming past the start finish line. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this mint green color that's taken over the field. I think there's four cars now that roughly look uh, similar. She's the only one running, uh, running sort of the white and mint combo though. And uh, yeah, like you say, been leading the charge all year. She's been phenomenally consistent over the different cars that we've had in this, this you know, all-star championship. There's another of the mint cars. There's Minty Boy, as actually Jimmy's named it. And now into the Cayman, of course, and the, and the circuits. So Emily's looked excellent. Jimmy's been getting better. He missed last week. Unfortunately, he was a little bit under the weather, so comes back out this time, maybe a little bit more refreshed. But look how much you got to work the wheel. The Cayman, when it starts to slide, it's very easy to tame, but it takes a lot of wheel movement to do it because, again, not a lot of downforce. You're kind of waiting for the tire to, to grip back in. And around this track, you have to work it. That's one of my favorite things about Montreal is not just the risk factor of the walls being so close, but the fact that it's very rewarding because of that, because not everyone wants to push. They're not that comfortable pushing the curbs, smoking the curbs, and really hanging the car out as hard as possible. Obviously, these Caymans love to look like Knock Hill up over the, the 14th corner, but but uh, yeah, it's, it's very rewarding for those that can get away with pushing the car. German driver Dan Suzuki then, again, two wheels up in the air on the exit of 14. Point about Jimmy Broadbent, by the way. I do love the fact that it's about 12 degrees Celsius where he's living right now. And he's already into full shorts and t-shirts mode. Um, he's yeah. in summer wear already. Still wearing the driving gloves, of course, but Jimmy B into summer mode. We're into double digits in the UK. Talking of the UK as well, this is an interesting one. No cyanide with us here today. Reason yes. for that is, um, due to the fact location around Exeter, an unexploded bomb from World War II has been discovered. And basically they had to evacuate a couple of thousand of houses. That's insane. He just moved into that house too, but that's yeah. great. It's, it, 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 just to jump off a of racing for a minute, you know, in Canada, we don't get a lot of that. Obviously the Halifax explosion is still the biggest uh, unplanned explosion in the world, um, even more than Beirut, which really opened my eyes to how big that was. I'm from Halifax. I always knew it was big, but that's insane. But if we didn't get a lot of the remnants of the war. So when I hear about these unexploded bombs, that's just insane. That's the, the, sort of the impact of that war. That's incredible. Looking at a Dutch driver, Maxine, right now, she's got herself the lovely um, kind of art behind her of the Nordschleife. She's going to need that one in about four weeks' time. As uh, just working on the exit of turn three, as we just turn our attention away from her right now. 
and this is a run uh, looking at our works driver 915 welcome to the all-star series Lorenz Vantor from Belgium working down the back straightaway down towards turn 13 and 14 of course the last corner is on the racetrack let's see how aggressive he is policeman number one number two actually rather smooth through there in the 915 car and calm and collected is Vantor. Where is he going to go in terms of the timing screens? He was sent place 1.3 seconds back and he moves up to second. Look at that. Just 37 one thousandths of a second there behind Emery. A little bit of disappointment, but he's going to be happy outside row number one. But here's the interesting thing about that is in the, in the third sector where he was the smoothest through the, the final chicane, he was actually faster. So mm. taking that curve, as we see, and a lot of people are taking the car, they're, they're opening up the first part of the entry, but as soon as you get off that first apex and you're not straight lining between the two, you gotta smoke that second sausage curve. It's not as fast and you're not getting as good a drive off of it either because the car's bouncing, you're, you know, a lot of that energy's not going directly into the forward momentum. So yeah, it's as smooth as king through there. If you can if you can be accurate with it, unfortunately, we'll, Will uh, four boosted media has not been accurate with his braking. Okay, I think he's actually just finished his hot lap, so he was yeah. just backing out of that one. He was P11, remains P11. 1.2 seconds back is Will Ford and that boosted media number four car. Um, game of our soul, unfortunately. Well, P number 12 for him, 1.8 seconds back, and he's not got time to set another lap. Number 48 car, though, Dan Suzuki, is on a flyer, we understand. He is a quarter of a second back right now from Emily Jones and Dan Suzuki so far this season. He's had some very good results. We just turn our attention over to a newcomer momentarily. This is Borges Azo, the Spanish driver, who I do want to hopefully get an on board with him because he is wearing a full shirt and bow tie today, Matt. Oh my goodness. He's my favorite already. Yeah, new to the championship, good friends with guys like Heike and a few of the other influencers in this series. So great to have him joining us. Uh, just to go back as well, you mentioned Lawrence Banthor. This is his first time in the championship, but he is our works for the week, uh, our works driver this week uh, of, of the championship. We've now had, I think, four um, join us throughout the course mm. of the season. So yeah. very cool to see. I love Rise Livery and this this came in. I think, I don't know why that zebra sort of Porsche red stripe in there. It just looked really, really good on this car. It does, and I'll have to say as well, taking you know the classic colours of black, white, and red, and really making a good show of it. Then, as that number nine car works down towards turns 13, 14, underneath the bridge. Um, thankfully, these drivers don't have to do a pit stop here because pitting at this racetrack, one of the scariest experiences I think in terms of circuit racing. We're going to see coming on towards pit road, but of course, in the qualifying, it's far karma. You should basically go straight on and really hope. But there's a driver not braking too hard as they go through the chicane. Or, or worse than that, you don't want to be the driver in front when the guy True. behind is heading for the pits and misjudges your turn in and collects you. I've seen that happen in so a, many support times. Race, oh, a support race around here. There's one a year. Guarantee. Yeah. You know, whether it's the Porsche Cup or anyone else, I've always seen someone just lose the back end of their car to a guy that dives for the pits. Lovely look then at turn 7A. This is basically the run down towards a second chicane that you're seeing on your screen right now. Qualifying is pretty much done and dusted. Um, we're going to have a look through your qualifying results in just one moment's time. But for those of you who want to know a little bit more about this track very quickly, just to let you know, just over 2.7 miles in length, 3.61 kilometers for those of you who prefer the metric units with five corners to the left and nine corners to the right. And there's your grid up on your screen. Emily Jones then will be starting on pole position. So three bonus points to her for that pole position joined by the Porsche works driver of Lawrence Van Tour on the outside of row number one. Dan Suzuki and Xavier Sanchez will be in row two with Pierre Oliver Vallet and Mattia Vaca on row number three. Cycling it back you've got Jimmy Broadbent and Gabriela Jokova on row four, newcomer Borgesazo on the inside of row five, joined alongside him by Jaroslav Honzik in row five. And then you see row six at the rear of your field today is Maxime Bilgens in row number seven. We're almost ready to go racing. Matt, if you were to give one piece of advice to these drivers before the green flag, what would you say? Stay off the wall. <laughs> That's about wall. it around here. Stay out of the wall, stay out of trouble, and uh, and work on consistency at Montreal. That's how you get faster around a yeah. track like this.
I always say a track like this as well with so much unpredictability, you need a bit of luck in your side, but you need to always have your wit around you. So we are almost ready now to go racing. The green flag is out. We are underway for our sprint race, 17 minutes in length, and it's a good start by your front row. In fact, Lawrence Vantor gets a fantastic run there and should be going to the race lead in that Bowser car. The Porsche works driver, fantastic start and outguns Emily into turns one, two, and three. This is where it gets tricky, though, because Dan Suzuki smartly positions himself again. The other corner that a lot of people don't talk about, Wall of Champions gets all the credit, but coming out of there, turn five in the background, or sorry, excuse me, turn four, it can be very difficult as well because there's actually a dip on the inside of the curb that has a similar effect as the sleeping policeman. Oh, we've lost our man already. The Porsche works driver, Van Thor, loses the back end in turn six, and it's drama behind for everyone into him. Sebastian Vettel is calling, he's asking for his incident back. Exactly the same place as what, of course, he saw in the 2011 Canadian Grand Prix. But Lawrence Van Tor, a beat up race car right now. We'll get a replay of that, I'm sure, in just a moment's time. But it was a solo car incident down into turn at number six. As it's just one of those things that can happen. This track has so many different areas where things can go wrong. But what it does mean is technically we have our third leader on of the race already because we had ourselves um, Emily Jones starting in pole position. Lawrence Mantua led the first couple of corners, but now we have a new leader at the front of your field in Dan as they work down this back straightaway replay coming up for you in right about now. The Vodafone replay. Let's have a look. Lawrence Mantua, a little bit of a wiggle coming into turn six actually, just over rotates that car. Solo car incident. That could have been a track blockage. I'm not going to lie to you there, Matt. It's very good that he tried to hold the brakes as much as possible. Yeah, and Heike and Rai were the two that had contact with him on the way by. I'm not sure the extent of the damage for them, but there certainly will be a little bit of damage on the front end of that car for Lawrence Van Thor, who's going to try to work his way back through the field. Dan Suzuki leading the way, though. It's a tough... It's you can definitely overtake here. It's one of the hardest braking circuits on the Formula 1 calendar. It certainly is one of the hardest braking circuits this year in our calendar. But you still have to line things up and set up corners in advance, especially in the Cayman, which doesn't have as much drafting effect. We talk about it week on and week out, uh, as the cup card did. So it's still going to be very difficult. And as a result, it can be very easy. Oh, I shouldn't say easy, but it's very possible to defend. So he's in a great position, Dan Suzuki. I know there's a lot of race left, but we look a little deeper in the field and we can see Jimmy working the wheel as hard as ever. Yep, Vodafone on board there with Jimmy Broadbent as he's working himself down towards what really is the second chicane here at Montreal. Um, just using the curbs there to help rotate the car as he's next coming down to the hairpin. A lot of people think that the hairpin is a good overtaking opportunity here. Actually, because of the short run from the second chicane down to the hairpin, it isn't as easy as one would think, Matt. Yeah, and that's kind of what I'm saying. You have to get the setup out of, out of, out of the chicane beforehand to even make it possible. If you don't get a run coming out of that chicane, you're not just going to get it done on the brakes, especially because you've got such a, a, an important exit from that hairpin as well. So you might even get inside and get it done, but you're just going to get overtaken again straight out here. So you've really got to be calculated through the second chicane, as you say. Olympic growing basing you just saw there at the top of your screen, used when Canada hosted the Olympics back in, I believe it was the 80s. 86, uh, I think, actually. Uh, 88, mate. I will find it out at some point. Uh, but Dan Suzuki. Right Dan Suzuki leads away by a tenth and a half for a second over Emily Jones. You've got Matthew Vaca in third place, and then you've got Sanchez in fourth, Jimmy Broadbent rounding out your top five. Battles going on. So we just had one person losing a couple of places there. We're looking at um, board right now. Go ahead, Matt. We're both right. Yeah, Calgary was 88, but we're both wrong. 76 was Montreal. So 86, yeah. I said 86, it was 76. Yeah, we're both wrong. There we are. Um, thank you very much there to Wikipedia. <laughs> so we're looking at Emily Jones. Um, she, she's right on the rear of Dan Suzuki. Of course, both Dan and Emily have won races this season. Emily, of course, leading the championship, but still being aggressive. She can start to settle for more second place finishes if she wants to. However, the important thing to note, Matt, is that even though there is a championship going on, it's the feature race wins that gives the most to these influencers' communities. Due to the prize money available, as Emily's going to try and go around the outside there, 
down on the hairpin, one of the best places to watch a race race in the world, by the way, and trying to do the over-under now down the back straightaway. But for these influencers, they want to win races because that's what gives them the most money to then share with their community. Yeah, absolutely. And this is exactly the run we talked about. She had a chance to have a look into the hairpin, but Dan sets up accordingly, gets a good exit out of the hairpin, keeps the inside for the final chicane, and therefore, does he lock her? Yes, does hold on to it out of the wall, or out of the final chicane, past the wall of champions. But again, Emily gets a run. She might this time have it off on the inside and the corner going in her favor. Yeah, indeed. So heading towards turn number one. First of all, it's a little flick that goes to the left. Emily's able to get alongside. They're working side by side through the very long turn two. Emily not quite able to get ahead, having to fall back into lines. We come down towards the first chicane. I remember, I believe it was Pedro Diniz who had a horrific accident here at one point. We're getting a replay coming up on your screen right about now. This is going to be with Gabby. Quick Gabby. Uh, currently 10 place uh, she's lost a couple of positions so far in this race look how close it is down into the chicane and she just basically outbreaks herself and when you get to that point it is sometimes easier to just give up the corner run onto the astros curb and basically take the time penalty because you're too aggressive in you are going to hit that wall on the outside oh 100 percent. you're going to smoke that that sleeping policeman like you talked about so yeah good call from her good read from norms van thor as well to spot that she was never going to make the corner. Checked up a little bit earlier and was able to tip in behind and still make it. But this battle up front is excellent as always. Dan Suzuki continuing to be so good with racecraft and Emery always is. So this is a real treat to see these two going at it and still maintaining a bit of a lead at this point. Heike's just behind two seconds back. Loves the fact that they're battling back and forth. But the nature of Montreal, it's not like other corners where your other battles where you sort of link into each other and slow each other down consistently you're still getting out of these big long straightaways so you don't quite lose as much time for battling around here it's kind of interesting actually you're right uh so the australian driver still hunting down the german emily jones second place dan suzuki in first and suzuki well he's playing a defensive drive but not really being too defensive about it you haven't seen him weaving across the racetrack that much a couple of laps ago he kind of just veered slightly to the left on the exit of the final chicane, just to make life a bit more difficult for Emily Jones, but nothing major. And sometimes just running your lines and actually almost blanking out the driver behind you is still the fastest way around the racetrack. Worth noting, by the way, um, Heike 360, um, Sanchez running in third place, still two seconds behind this leading duo. So if they do start scrapping it out, then, you know, Sanchez is going to start getting back into play. We've got the triple box up right now. Dazuki on the left-hand side. Emily Jones on the right-hand side. You can see that Emily's still taking it pretty relaxed, to be fair, um, compared to Danny. You can see he's really clenching that wheel right now. 100% focus as they come down into chicane number two. Oh, she's got a lot of curb. Tightens the corner up a lot more. That's going to give her a bit of a run, though, down into turn 10. Heavy braking point. She's overlapped very early, but Dan smartly positions his car to the inside, forces her to go the long way around the hairpin. Does she try? Oh, she wants to hold it. Interesting. It can be done. We've seen a lot of drivers hold the outside. It's not so much about hitting the apex as much as it's getting a smooth radius, but we've also seen people try and do the undercut. This is going to give Emery another run, but again, Dan holds the inside, so she needs to be very far ahead if she wants to try and hold this through the chicane. They're both smiling now, so they're, they're really enjoying this afternoon. You are, of course, watching the All-Star Series here. It is the prelude to the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup by iRacing, which is coming up in just under one hour's time. Our coverage will start for that immediately after we finish our coverage of these two races. And just to let you know, um, we talked earlier on about Lawrence Vantor. He had himself, of course, that incident, turn six, lap number one. He's now in seventh place. He's got himself past Will Ford. He's got himself past Quick Gabby. got himself past Gamer Muscle. So he's moving himself slowly through the field. But Lawrence Vantor has got about four seconds to go. In fact, he just lost position. Got a replay up here for Jimmy Broadbent in the double O car. This is down in towards turn number one jimmy diving down the inside and spinning around the number nine there of right and i'm sure the number nine not going to be too happy with that and i know that jimmy broadbent talks about no punterino 
Yeah. But that was very close to Pontorino there. I would say it was. I don't know that he was trying to make a move or if he realized he was too deep on the brakes and was trying to think avoiding action, unfortunately, and nowhere else to go. Um, but either way, that's on him. Uh, no question about it. So an unfortunate situation. To go back to the Van Thor point, yeah, I think he was guilty of what we've seen a few of the works drivers do that come in and jump in these cars. They're fast. No doubt they've got incredible race craft in real life. That's why they are, of course, works drivers. But there's always the cold tire aspect and getting used to the race craft of, of, of this field. And, and I think, uh, yeah, Van Thor got caught up by the cold tires early. Again, reverse grid for race number two. So we'll see if he can make the most of it. We oftentimes see them redeem themselves in those situations. But yeah. Tough battle to back, or it's tough to battle back through this uh, this field, being as competitive as it has become in the All Star race. I have to say, compared to race one where we last saw you, will they've all gotten so much quicker? They have. Um, in terms of Ryan Fantor, by the way, our insider um, over at Porsche told us that it's been a couple of months since he's been running actively on iRacing. He is a long term member of the iRacing community, but you're completely right. Cold tires, start of the race. The one thing that's different between sim racing and racing in one of Porsche's and many, many racing series around the world is that you can feel the grip of the cold tires when you're on the racetrack, which the, the physical sensation is slightly more difficult to replicate. It's Emily Jones, what a move there. That's, Down the inside, that's incredible. Yeah, that's a forceful move, and now it leaves Dan Suzuki on the back foot because he gets no drive off the corner, and Heike's going to slip through to take over P2. Very well done from Emery. She normally almost outbreaks herself heading into turn six, but that is a phenomenal. I love this. Look at Sanchez. Heike is just commentating his whole way through. He's loving it. He's, I, I'm sure he's super fun to watch on his stream because he's always animated and... Uh, gesticulating everything that's going on both with body language and words. I, I'm impressed at how much he's able to talk while being this quick. I think he's talking more than we were at that point in time yeah, as well. Yeah, he might be. I was trying to keep up. Second place for him right now. He's been able to get himself past Dan Suzuki. I did actually say that. Being two seconds back when that battle was going on a couple of laps ago, I did say that if those two were to go, um, Suzuki and Emery, to go into battle at a tight corner, it would have opened the door up to Sanchez. And Sanchez has played this race incredibly well just waiting for his opportunity moved up from third into second place and the spanish driver right now is not that far back from emily actually um, it's saying one minute 47 it's actually not i'd say it's about seven eight tenths of a second maximum as they come down into the final chicane again yeah we'll see if if uh, dan now can get back on the bumper of Heike. This is the battle a bit further back, so we've got a battle of three, and then a bit of a gap, and then a battle of three more for sixth place. And it's uh, it's not too bad off either. I think this is actually just about to come into its own because right now you can see Pipiello is making his move to get much closer and a much better line through turn one. That's going to set him up beautifully through Senna, turn number two, and down into the first chicane. It's tough to make a pass there, though. It's very difficult. We saw Emery do it brilliantly by holding the outside, but the inside doesn't quite work because of how quick the corner comes back the other way. I would love to get another replay of Emily Jones in that pass because that is probably one of the most difficult parts of the racetrack to really execute a move, especially for the race lead, especially as we've seen as well. And how that's close unless, it was. you're Vitell and you go through the grass and then come back on and get a five-second penalty. Well, that, yes. yeah, yeah. Let's let's not forget about that one. And then knock over some the move around some little yeah. signs. Yeah, all those. Sorts I was of there things. for that. It was great. It was actually <laughs> pretty hilarious to listen to the people react to that. Yeah, I can imagine. Absolutely imagine this battle going on for fifth and sixth as well. Um, as I say, Jardier um, looking as though he's got the better of the two behind him, Jimmy Broadbent and Pierre Oliver Vallette. And that's about to say going on for fifth and sixth. They got down the left hand side of your screen. That is Pierre Oliver Vallette, who has won a race, of course, won a race on round event number four of the championship. Then on the other side of your screen, currently fourth place in the race. That was a bit of a mean look there by Pierre. Um, but then on the right-hand side of your screen, you've got the number 12 car of Jardier. And, well, Jaroslav Honzik, he looks so, as I say, he has got the momentum to stay in that fourth place, and he's kind of taking it easy behind the wheel in some regards. No one hitting that wall of champions just yet. I think that was a close call by Jardier. You can see it in the expression in his face as he held his breath for a moment. But uh, so far, everyone's been very consistent. I'm very impressed as well, especially with the wheel-to-wheel -wheel with Emery. Yeah. I thought when they went side-by-side -side into turns three and 
or excuse me, um, yeah, three and four. I'm losing my numbers here. I'm usually referring to things by name around this track. The odd one that I can do that, but uh, I thought for sure Dan was going to hit the wall on the outside, but even they kept it together. So very, very impressive all the way through the field so far as we look back to the lead. Emery's still just, just barely ahead at this point. I think Ike's done very well to hold on this much, but it's two minutes to go on the clock. This will be the penultimate lap. They'll have one more by. Uh, and it should be the final next time. So it's going to be a difficult task, I think, for him to get any closer. Yeah, indeed. It's worth noting, by the way, that um, Xavier Sanchez, Hikey 360, you may know him, of course, has had a second place and a couple of thirds in this season so far. Never, though, been on the top step of the podium, either in a sprint or a feature race. So that is one that is looking to go a little bit better than he has so far this season. And you're completely right about driving standards, by the way. I wanted to talk about this, uh, both when I wasn't here, now when I am here again. Um, and over the course of the season, I think the stewards have only actually um, issued one infraction to the drivers because we, we understand that, you know, these drivers, they, they race more for entertainment in some cases. They are all massively competent. But the driving standards, you're correct, it's been incredible to see them not only develop to the cars, but the race craft amongst them as well. And I think for that reason, and I'll be honest, I mean, they are influencers. They're busy with their own respective streams and... You know, okay, I've got a championship coming up. We're going to run it. Yeah, whatever. You knew the first weekend, and you go, okay, that was fun. But I think because the first weekend was actually quite competitive, and there was a few people that were a little faster than maybe others were expecting, everyone's kind of actually gotten quite serious about this. And each week, where it's, it seems like they're more and more prepared, and the field is getting closer and closer. The driving standards have improved. Not that they were ever that far off. Like you say, there's not been many penalties, but I think it's just gotten better and better in this influencer series. And I, I think there's a bit of a rivalry going on between them. A fun one, of course, a bit of banter, but... They're all uh, definitely out to win now. It's going to be very close, by the way, in terms of whether we get another lap in or not. In fact, no, it's not. I was looking at the wrong part of the racetrack. This is the last lap of the sprint race. They just worked themselves there for the exit of turn six and seven. So this is the last lap of the sprint race. It is Emily Jones leading by just under half a second over. Um, Xavier Sanchez, the Spanish driver in the number 23 car. Then Dan Suki, the German, is running in third place right now. Your top three separated by just 1.4 seconds as they head themselves down into the hairpin. For the final time in the sprint race, you just see there, the clock has expired. Up on the wheel is Sanchez. I think, though, he is too far back to really make a move. It would be a lunge and a half. Matt said already, there's not as much drafting in these Caymans compared to what you'd get in the 911 Cup car or even the 911 RSR. And I think that Emily Jones, I think she knows now that so long as she doesn't hit the wall of champions in this the final corner, she takes a hell of a lot of curb. But Emily Jones is going to win our sprint race here today. It is going to be Xavier Sanchez in second. And Dan Suzuki will round out your podium. As uh, just having a look back then, fourth place, fifth place, and sixth place was close. We have got one more battle, though, coming into the final corner there, Max. Yeah, Gamer Muscle trying to look down the inside of Ryan. Couldn't quite get it done. Showed the nose, not to be blamed, but also smartly backed out of it because not nearly far enough alongside. But great race all the way through as we see the final few uh, runners coming across the line. Lawrence Van Thor, just to note, did finish down in 11th place. So despite that he qualified in second, he will now actually, I think he was that classified as 12th across the line. So we didn't quite catch that. So that should put him on the front row for the uh, for the, the reverse grid. But Emery, that's a great race. Heike almost looks slightly disappointed not to be up uh, a little bit further. He definitely had the pace, but second place is great for him as well. You're completely right. As there's a look then at your results up on your screen. And for those of you who are new to the series, what we do now, we do a flip -a rooney We have Emily Jones starting at the very rear of the field and all the drivers are inverted for this, our next race, which is going to be 22 minutes long. And we have seen that these races have been incredible. Just to see the methodicalness sometimes of drivers, works and influences trying to get themselves through the field. Here's your updated point. And Emily Jones now has a 50 point advantage over Dan Suzuki. Suzuki second place in the championship and Jardy in third, 65 points back from Emily Jones. And of course, Lance Van Tour is now on the board, his first race, four points to him, Borges Arzo on the board, five points to him, but they are, of course, for the time being, at 
the rear of your championship. Worth noting that it's a nice little battle going on there for sixth and seventh place between Pierre Oliver Vallette and Gabriella Jakova for one point separating them out there, Matt. That's going to be fun to watch. And also, um, it's very close between Jimmy Broadbent and Matteo Vaca. Yeah, it's super close all the way through. I mean, there's a lot going on here. And like I say, there's a bit of rivalries between them to continue to improve in that, that situation. So it's gotten to be fun. I think that's the first and foremost thing. These guys are influencers. They are having a lot of fun with this, but they're, they're, they're getting more and more serious each week. So super cool to see. I'm very curious to see how this reverse sprint goes because Montreal is misleading. Um, I say there's a lot of big breaking points. You already mentioned it going into turn 10, the hairpin. You think you can make a move there, but it's not as easy as it seems. It's the same going down the, the very long back straight between the hairpin and, and the final chicane. It's very easy to get alongside, but it is a very tight chicane coming at you. So again, it's one of those misleading tracks where you have so much opportunity that you never lose hope, but you don't necessarily always get the move done. That's why I was very impressed with Emery and a very unorthodox place to pass as well actually made the move stick. So. It's, it's a fun track for that reason. I did a, a, a race here in GTE with Race Sim Canada. I was running the Porsche. The front three of us were all in Porsches. We stayed bumper to bumper for 36 laps, and I've never sweated so much in my life. And I never got by, even though I was probably the fastest of three of us, and I had the pace, but I loved it because it's just such a great track to battle on for that reason. You're always so close, but you have to be perfect to make the move. You made a really interesting point earlier on about the fact that the um, final chicane uh, we saw, I believe it was Heike holding his breath. I have exactly that same situation at the final corner at Montreal compared to the first corner at the Indianapolis Oval. You literally hold your breath, hope you get the line happening, hope it all works out for you. So this track, you know, so many challenges. It looks simple on paper, but it's absolutely not overtaking in this the feature race is going to be fascinating to watch by the way if you are new to iRacing then head over to iRacing.com right now to find out how you can start your iRacing journey and who knows maybe one day you'll end up an influencer like some of these people that you see on your screen so you see it there head over to iRacing.com right now and don't forget after our next race do not go anywhere because we have got countdown presented by tag Hoya, and then of course the porsche tag Hoya esports supercut by iRacing hopefully matt by which point the light that's just gone off behind me will be working once again <laughs> well all my lights went out last night so it's not the worst thing um, as we'll take a look again at the circuit, just to show you again some of the points we talked about around Circuit de Gilles Villeneuve. Uh, it's a flat circuit. It's actually on a man-made island, two of them, in fact. So, Ile Notre Dame, Parc Jean Drapeau, that's all this collective space. The rowing regatta, the lane beside you saw it, that's down the back straight, but tons of uh, tons of heavy braking points in that turn 10, obviously then turn 13, and turn number one all require you to be pretty damn accurate with your left foot as it is in these cars, or maybe someone's right foot braking, but typically left foot, and, uh, and very technical through the first sector as well, where it's very twisty, and um, it's very important to keep your line consistent throughout. Yep, and I say I absolutely love this track. 4.36 kilometers in length, very little elevation. You've got the Olympic rowing basin we talked about already. 1976 Olympics and 14 corners, of which five of them go to the left, nine of them go to the right. I'm going to say that the, the, the 14 corners goes back, I think the reason they still call it that is to the original uh, layout, which I think yeah. was last used in the late 70s, where coming out of the hairpin was actually where this pit straightaway was, and there was more of a pronounced chicane down on the back straight mm. that's obviously been straightened out pits were moved um and i consider it actually 12 corners but there is 14 numbered i think because that's what it was traditionally um, you and i can get into some arguments we would go into road atlanta if i was here at road atlanta we'd be talking about a's and b's and corners and yeah, the s's not even numbered yes. even though there's there are corners in the world that are numbered and also have names well here's corner one and two is the senna Center corner. Yep. Uh, you, you, I don't know why you've given the S's a name but not a number as well because it doesn't correlate. I, anyway, yes, I yep. agree. There's a lot of questionable things. It's like ski hills. I always make this comparison. You check the map on like what's open and it's like 36 trails open today and it's like upper corduroy, lower corduroy, middle court. That, well, that's one trail, guys. Come on. Yeah. Um, there's a starting grid, by the way, for your main race. It is going to be Maxime Bouchemans in the pole position alongside work driver Lawrence Vantor. Of course, he started the first race in second place. Then he had a whoopsie daisy down at turn six, lap number one. Newcomer to the series, Borges Arzo, inside row number two. Alongside him will be James West, then Matteo Vaca and Gabriela Jokova on row three. 
Will Forward and Pierre Oliver Vallet on row number four with Jimmy Broadbent and Yaroslav Fonzik on row five. Dan Suzuki, Xavier Sanchez on row number six and at the very rear of your field, although on the clean side of the racetrack, will be Emily Jones. So we are getting to the point now where we're ready almost for race number two. And they are away. Green flag is out. 22 minutes of racing start right about now. And this time in towards turns one and two again. Look at that. Lawrence Van Tour is going to go to the race lead. It's going to be a case of right now, man. Will they be able to hold it through turn number six? Yeah, poor Zonso getting his uh, taste of the series for the first time. Gets wheel to wheel with Rye. A little bit of contact between them, but it's two by two all the way through. Emery's going to get involved. I thought she might want to sit back a little more and let it play itself out, but she's oh. already made place on one. This is why I said sitting back might be why she gets through it, but Gamer Muscle goes around and a few cars collected, including that of Jimmy Broadbent. And he looks like Will Ford. Yeah, Will Ford, the Boosted Media car there, involved in that one as well. Look at the lead. Lawrence Van Tour has already overboard Gisazo. It's over a second on track. They head themselves down to the second chicane, but we can confirm that it was um, Gamer Muscle involved in that first incident, as well as Boosted Media. So we did have two drivers involved, James West and Will Ford. And we know that Jimmy Broadbent in the double O car might have some damage as well. I want to get a replay of that one from Emily Jones because she was so lucky. I, I honestly thought she was going to sit back more for that exact yeah. reason. It's such a bottleneck through that first, I would say, half the lap because it just never settles down until you get after the second chicane. So she did well to avoid that, especially where I think she was forced to the inside of the second part of that chicane, which is ultimately where the incident ended up. So she did well to be looking ahead and be prepared for that. What did I say earlier on in this broadcast? Have your wits around you and have a little bit of luck. I think she had points there I, in the sequence I, I, of 500 minutes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say there's a lot of luck in racing mechanically, but you create your own luck as a driver. I think yeah. luck exists, I'll never say it doesn't, but you create your own luck. And it comes to what you said, have your wits about you and be looking ahead, anticipating, and then you'll get some luck. If you're not doing the, the basics, you're never gonna get lucky. Okay, this is fascinating. After one lap, around the circuit Gilles Villeneuve. We have ourselves Lawrence Van Tour leading by almost three seconds over Borja Zavo. Um, then you've got yourself in third place right now. Um, a driver who, let's be honest, has won a race so far this season. It's Gabriela Zilkova. She is looking very strong in third place. But Dan Suzuki, look at the run he's had already in this second race up into fourth position and really hunting down Zilkova. Absolutely, yeah, and quick Gabby has, she's been, it's, it's tough to describe because I want to say she's been consistently quick, but at times she's a little further down the order. The problem is that there's been people that have kind of been peaking at different circuits and she hasn't quite been on that level at times, but she's definitely one to watch when she's got a circuit or a car that com she's comfortable with. So definitely a threat. Dan Suzuki already all over her though, and you know how fast he is. That is a bold move into this, in a hairpin, excuse me. She does well to see that coming because I think that was pretty late and deep and he makes it stick, but does he hold it down the back straight is the better question. Rye might also get a sniff at this as well. Again, not as much of a draft as you get from the cup car, but he's certainly within striking distance. And you see they'll go side by side and they'll run down towards the final chicane. And this is where you need to know your racetrack because if you do allow the driver to take the ultra tight line into the hairpin, you can then get the run down the back straight away. But again, that time, your Cobra just opting to yield there and allows Dan Suzuki to go ahead because going too wide into turns 13, 14 can be a recipe for disaster. And just on the rear now of your Cobra, by the way, is Matthew Vaca in the number nine car. He's had a good, strong start to this second race. Yeah, super good. I'm, and we've seen him. If he's someone that if he gets in these situations and there's battling going on around, he's always able to tag in with it, hold on to it. He's definitely had some good results this season, so don't rule him out of this. And the fact that he's already back on Gabby trying to chase through that battle. Dan's kind of cleared away at this point, chasing down. Zanzo, but this is this is definitely a position where he can strike from and just behind him as well you've got Yardier who we know is was battling at the start of the first race as well in that battle for sixth so I, again the reverse grid on this particular circuit isn't as I think as much of a gift per se to the to the front runners it's going to be it's very difficult to get through and everyone's been super close yeah we're going to get ourselves ready for a Vodafone replay then and uh, let's have a look at what happened at the start of
of our race here today. We'll get that one up uh, right about now for you. And there we are, two wide. And we saw that one work so successfully in the battle for the race lead in your sprint race. Didn't work as well here at the start of our feature. A couple of good looks there. Here's the one that we really want to see, though. This is Emily Jones. And this is when you need to always say, have your wits around you, dive to the right-hand side of the racetrack. And this is where double yellow flags, we always talk about it in terms of actual circuit racing. It's slow down and be prepared to stop. Emily was prepared to stop at that moment, and that's what saved her. Even in real life in that situation, though, she's all, it arrives at the incident so quickly, the marshals are barely going to have the flags over yeah. the wall. So that's just 100% that's just looking far enough ahead, reading the, the incident and, uh, and being prepared. So, yeah, very, very good driving from her, very heads up. Sometimes you need to anticipate what the flag would be, even if the flag isn't actually out on track, um, just because of safety and everything else. Um, but out front, it's worth noting that Borges Arzo has closed about a second to Lawrence Landfall right now. So wow. it was a three second gap. It's now down to just under two. In fact, this last lap, Lawrence Landfall has lost himself about half a second alone. So Borges Zazo is closing and he's bringing Dan Suzuki with him. Yeah, that's impressive for the, uh, the newcomer to the series. Both, in fact, I suppose, are both of the guys at the front. Van Thor, this is his first week in uh, as a Porsche Works driver in this influencer, the All-Star Series. But obviously, uh, Zazo, this is his first time ever. Oh, big run, big deep wide entry from Dan Suzuki. That's going to cost him dearly because he loses all the momentum through the chicane and already Gabby's on the back of it. Rye might even get a sniff if he's not careful. Has to pretty much concede the corner at this point to Gabby. What a hit he is. Desperately deep under the brakes every time. He's certainly got braking for the hairpin figured out. Gabby wanted to try and defend that, but nearly moved too late. That's going to bottleneck all of them. And now we've got to run down the straightaway. Rye even up over the curve for turn 11. Yep, um, Gabby was one of the drivers after Silverstone who was brought up to the steward's office. And I think she had that in the back of her mind as she made that half move down into the hairpin and remains in fourth place. But as a consequence, that train of cars is all now 1.5 back from Borges Arzo. So it's one of those times, and I talk about this quite a lot when I commentate over racing that, but it's one of those times when sometimes now you need to play follow the leader the next five minutes to get back up and work almost together to get towards the front of this train once again because otherwise it's going to be a two-horse race come down to the last three laps absolutely yeah again montreal you don't give up as much for tripping over each other because of the straightaways that proceed after most of the the overtaking opportunities but at the same time it's you're right you need to be careful how much you give away if you think you've got pace to battle for the front it's so disappointing when suddenly that that those cars disappear and that opportunity uh gets away from you because of incidents and people battling behind and having to defend constantly so the problem with that is it's easy to say that for someone like dan suzuki or quick gabby who are close enough to the front but if i'm at the back of this train of cars if i'm rye if i'm yardier any of these guys i want to be on it all the time i want to make positions anywhere that i can I do have to say, by the way, I'm not sure which one impressed me most when we had that split screen a moment ago. Whether it's Quick Gabby's lighting or Dan Suzuki's impressive guitar collection. Yeah. I think they both had something going for them now on their own boards. Thank you very much, by the way, to all the drivers who are allowing us into their, well, their actual homes as a part of this series as well. It does add some incredible talking points to us. And actually, we get to see how some of these influencers, their rigs, their setups, I've been talking to them over the course of this season. Um, I remember the 65-inch triple screen monitors with the uh, the opportunity to then actually remove the bezels between the screens as well. Incredible mm -hmm. talking point across these influences. Uh, back to the racing, though. We have got side-by-side side here. Emily Jones thinking, thinking about going down to the inside of Matty Avaco there. But again, she wasn't close enough, and she realized that she couldn't make the move down into turn 13, 14. But a truly outside, inside line into turns one, two, and three, and she does have the, the position there before they even get down to turn number one. So it looks as though that Vaca might have just eased off the noisy pedal to let her go free. Yeah, she's been inching closer, Emily Jones, each time, so finally does get by. She's done the fastest lap of the race by, well, to be fair, she's been six tenths faster than the leader in Lawrence Van Thorpe, but only two tenths faster than Dan Suzuki, who we saw how much they battled in the first race. Is currently running in third. So she's got pace. Whether or not she can get it done, we, she's definitely been very good at overtaking in, in spots where we don't typically see overtakes happen around this circuit. But it's it's a lot of cars in front of her, considering there's 12 minutes left. I know that sounds like a lot in the context of these races, but it's not when you think about Montreal and, 
and how difficult it is to get by. And I like, I love it. I mean, I know it sounds like I'm saying this is a difficult track to overtake. That's not necessarily the same thing as saying there isn't opportunity, because that's, I think, what happens in a lot of circuits is you just don't even see it happen, and it kind of becomes a procession. At least around here, you get a lot of wheel to wheel, and both drivers have to be pretty spot on. Yes, you can defend, and very successfully, but you can also give up very easily, and, and you've got so many opportunities behind trying to get by, and that is exactly the point. Gabby nearly makes a mistake under braking, manages to hold her own coming out of the hairpin, gets a good drive off the corner, but nearly gives up a spot as a result. That is actually an iRacing incident all in itself. Remember that your camera is indeed on the left side of the car, as is the driving seat. Clipping the wall on the way by the number 12 car was the RDA. Um, I've done that many times down that straightaway, because you think, oh, I'm just going in a straight line here and that wall does come out of at you. It does, it really does indeed. And I, I think going back to the point you made earlier on about this being such a momentum car, this is really one of those tracks where it tests you more not necessarily about your overtaking opportunities, but your, your ability to basically nail corner after corner, lap after lap, and consistency is so key here because we've seen it already, just one bad mood and it will completely ruin your race. We've got on board here, we're, we're for Boosted Media currently 13th place at the rear of the field, unfortunately. And himself a bit of a rough day here um, and well unfortunately we didn't see half of his head but look at that rig uh, as we cut away here and we go to another pink roomed um, here this is gaming muscle currently 12th place on track absolutely love the slivery by the way Matt yeah it's super cool looking livery uh, I think it's one of the cooler ones we've seen, it's a repetition of his logo throughout in different colors, creates kind of a cool camouflage look, a uh, psychedelic look to the car. Very interesting indeed. Um, and this is a great little battle at the back as all three of them are very tightly compacted through turn five. We saw Brendan Hartley actually do a cool little Tony Hawk wall ride there at one point in time uh, in his Toro Rosso days. So um, it's, it's definitely everywhere around this track, something's happened. There's so much history here. Um, and just, just quickly back to your point about sort of being consistent. The reason I say, as we see Dan Suzuki all over the front, consistency is key here because yes, you can risk and yes, you can push, but there's more uh, potential for, for, for drama and mistakes to happen and the walls to catch you out than other tracks. So it's not like you can just go, I'm going to nail a fast lap as Dan Suzuki tries to again show off his impressiveness under braking. Uh, you can't necessarily just go for ultimate pace. You first need to set a benchmark because then once you get your breaking points dialed in, once you get your lines dialed in, you can start to change them incrementally without just suddenly smoking the walls. So that's why I think consistency at a place like this and a street circuit is more important than outright pace. But if I'm on board with Gabriela Zilkova, quick Gabby, running, well, she just lost a position there to um, Chardier because she just ran wide down at turn number two, that long sweeping right hand up. And as a consequence of that, the number 11 is down into fifth place on track. And meanwhile, you, as I say, you have Chardier up one place into fourth position. They've been battling it out like quite a lot in this event so far. We look on board then with um, Gabriela Zilkova as behind. Interestingly enough, it is another of our lady drivers in this field because Emily Jones up into sick, looking to break into the top five. Absolutely. This quick Gabby continues to just try and hold pace with the front runners. This slides a little bit out of turn number seven, not uncommon. You'll see that a lot later on in PESC with a lot of the drivers clipping that curve and trying to get power down with the rear engine cup car. As Emily Jones, we jump on board, is alongside at this point with Quick Gabby trying to hold that outside undercut potential. Not quite. She wants to close the line so she can get a drive. And unfortunately, two into one doesn't go. The first rule of racing is the first rule of physics. Two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. So she'll have to sit back and try to wait another lap to make this move. But again, it was 12 minutes. We last spoke about her position in sixth. I suppose it was seventh, actually, I should say. She was behind right at that point. We've lost four minutes. She's made up one position. This is a tough ask for her to make it through mm -hmm. the field. It is, and I, we've seen uh, almost that incident happening before down at the hairpin, because if you're the driver on the inside, you want to basically unravel the steering wheel to give yourself maximum traction, maximum momentum coming off the hairpin. But if you're the driver on the outside, there's a big concrete wall there waiting for you if you try to do the same. So what you want to do is get that car as straight as possible, as quickly as possible, and you're right. Physics 2 can't go into 1 as we're looking once again on board with the number 12 car right now. This, of course, is Jaroslav Honzik as he is battling it out 
with Borgia's Arze just ahead. And Borgia, after running in no man's land at part of this race, has really now got a lot of pressure behind him once again. And Jardier just four attempts of a second back with seven minutes of racing to go. This one might well come down, Matt, too, exactly when they get that white flag. Because I think that a couple of these drivers are just hoping oh. and love to have that extra lap. Boris got deep under braking. I was going to say, that is a very late braking point for the Cayman. That's more where you would break with the RSR potentially under the bridge, under that gantry that heads over the circuit. And as a result, just went a little bit deep for the first apex. Still, though, he's done well to get on the power and keep the drive because that allows him to have at least a sniff into the hairpin. Finally, we'll see the famous undercut pay off. But again, the draft battle continues down the straights. One position for now for Yardier, who gets back into the podium. But it's not done there, not even close. It is worth as ever remembering that the top three drivers in this race will get themselves uh, essentially credits to give to their community. As a thank you from Porsche and iRacing for, you know, being a participant in this series. So the drivers don't actually take away anything themselves. All the prize money will go to their community. We'll talk more about that one, of course, as the race concludes. I think a beneficiary of that two wide situation will be Emily Jones. She's going to have the outside line into one and let's see she gets the inside line into two she will she get the line she's ahead on the exit of two and yeah she's got the position there over quick gabby so she'll cover now down into sixth place emily jones Emery up into fifth and you know position secure as they work through the first of the chicanes and now emily jones is 1.5 seconds back from the podium with about three maybe four laps worth of racing to go Good positioning of the car by Emily Jones after making the move as well. She knows that the circuit kind of kinks to the right, so she positioned it so that her car, without moving, goes across the circuit. And Gabby, you can see, was desperately swinging behind, trying to find a way to get alongside again. So didn't quite work out. It's cost her, actually, quite a bit of momentum as well as Gabby's now in the clutches of Rye. Continues to, I mean, her pace is there. It's just so close between them that that little bit, that last little bit, is costing her over the course of this race. And... It's now going to be her fighting to hold on to sixth place rather than the third place she was in at the start of the race. Meanwhile, down to the hairpin again, as we see Borazonzo still trying to hold his nerve with Yardier as Emily Jones closing up behind. And her pace when there's no one in front of her is exceptional, so she'll easily catch up to these guys. Question is, can she get it done with enough time left on the clock? I think a few mistakes with them battling each other might come into play here for her. I like for need to, I should yeah. say. You're right. A wonderful look there at Henny Cam for a moment as we head down to 13 14 once again. Out front, just to let you know, Lawrence Lanthor is now leading by 3.2 seconds over Dan Suzuki as we have a look from the rear of. I'm not going to lie to you at this point. It's a little bit difficult to work out who that is because everyone's got exactly the same rear spoiler, the Tag Heuer logo on the rear. But we can now say that was Dan Suzuki looking back towards um, Jaroslav Honzik in uh, the number 12 car. Gap between them. 1.2 seconds right now which again if um Hunzik has a good couple of laps he can put himself back into contention for second place however unless Lawrence Lantor makes a mistake I've got to be honest at this point Matt races in the bag for him hopefully that won't be the curse of and this, this is kind of what I expected he's the one guy that we knew had the pace and yeah he made the mistake in race one He's not, these guys, the pros especially, are not the kind of people that are going to make the same mistake twice. Okay, he got caught up by cold tires race one. Now he gets the reverse grid. Yeah, absolutely smooth sailing for him. We've seen the same from Matty Campbell in these situations. Um, and a lot of the guys that came in. Larry Tenvura, unfortunately, didn't quite go the same. He was battling in race one. And second race, I think he got involved with contact and had damage and couldn't couldn't achieve that. But this this is not surprising. So Van Thor getting away. The problem is Emery can't get through the field fast enough to maybe give him a challenge. And Dan Suzuki... He's quick, but it's quite a gap as well by the time he got up there. And his pace right now, just to note, is just about the same over the last lap. So um, whether the tires are coming in or not, they've all kind of fallen off about a half second from their ultimate pace. But um, I think Van Thor, you're right. This is looking pretty cozy. I don't want to say it too soon because yeah. God forbid. But yeah, he's, he's there right now. Just let you know, Emery, um, Emily Jones is up now into fourth place. Borges Arzo, not sure if he went wide or somewhere, but dropped back down into fifth place and actually it's two seconds now back 
from Emily Jones. It seems to me a lot of these drivers have really used their tyres up trying to defend positions because the gaps have really just eaten out dramatically in the last five minutes or so. The battle that we really want to pay attention to is the battle for second, which really now is a free horse race because you've got yourself Dan Suzuki, Jardie and Emery all battling it out. You've also though got the battle going on for P number six between Quick Gabby and Rai as they scrap it out for sixth place on track. Emily Jones is literally three tenths of a second away from a podium and is within a second of second place in this event. So it looked early on that she was having to, you know, take her time, be methodical, picking her way through traffic. I wonder, Matt, whether she is also trying to just preserve her tires a little bit to make herself a little bit easier in terms of overtaking late on in the race. Yeah, it's difficult to say. I think because she has such great pace, um, anyway, in the yeah in the bag, she's because she's following and can't necessarily use that pace. That makes it a little bit easier for her to hold on to the battle while saving tires. So I think that's just a benefit of her pace overall, and it has led to exactly what you say: her car being in great shape, her tires being in great shape to really go on the attack this late. And with a minute and sixteen left, this time by will be the final lap. Whether or not she can get on the podium. Still up for debate, but she certainly has given herself a great chance to do so as Lawrence Vanthill just fades from shot. The foreground should have this wrapped up. Important to note as well, he races for Fast Motorsports and IMSA WeatherTech Series this year. And that is a Canadian team, but this is a circuit he'll have never driven in real life. So kind of a connection there. But now we see it. Emery, great run off the final corner. She wants to get this done early in the lap, maybe even get a chance for Dan Suzuki if she can make this stick as it's going to be a run then white flag will be out this time by one more lap to go wonderful look then from the rear of suzuki as emily jones will actually get the position again it's going to be a case of can she make sure she keeps the perfect line into the first chicane yes she can however as a consequence she's now seven tenths of a second back from suzuki as you have a look then on the vodafone on board of dan suzuki number 48 car working into turn number six and matt it looks as though it's going to be a very tall ask. I think Suzuki, unless he makes a mistake, should be good for second. Yeah, she did such a great job of letting off the brakes early in turn one, allowing the car to hold speed around the outside. It's such a tempting thing because it's going to be understeering. You're going to be fighting it just to stay alongside at that point, Yardia. So she gets the position for turn number two, but she missed the apex just slightly in watching where Yardia had gone for turn four. And that means she lost too much space, I think, to Dan Suzuki. So into turn 10, she'll close up. Not an opportunity here. It might give her a chance into the chicane, but I don't think she's going to be close enough overall. And it would have been a tall order to get two on this lap anyway, but I think just missing that apex a little bit cost her quite a bit in, in any real potential of doing so. Great drive to back to the podium, but I, we'll see. I don't think she's quite there. Let's though go to the front of the field. We haven't talked about him for a very long time. Ironically, the Bose post race show is coming up next, and it's the Bose sponsored car who is going to be heading down into the final corner in first place lawrence Vantor, the number 915 car had a miserable outing in race number one bounces back and will win the feature race here in the porsche all-stars race and it's going to be lawrence Van Tor winning the race and then dan suzuki in second place emily jones rounds out your podium with um Jardier in fourth place and borges also Running out your top five. That was entertaining. I, I'm not going to lie to you, Matt. Even though it's not one of those races where you see multiple passes a lap, the methodicalness of some of these drivers and the, the storylines that were building up over the course of the race, that was a fun race to watch as a result yeah. dropping your screen. That was fantastic to watch. And there you see it. Van Thor, 1.2 seconds ahead. Dan Suzuki finishes in second place. But Emery was the story all the way through. And what a great drive from her to avoid that accident on the first lap as well, Will. Yeah, um, it, 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 incredible, incredible. The fact that she was able to choose the right direction, move to the right-hand side of the racetrack after that first she came, saved her race, recovered, moved up to third place at the end. Jaroslav Honzik in fourth place, Borja Zazo in fifth, Gabriela Shikova um, started off well, fell back towards the end of the race, finishes in sixth place, Matija Vaca in P number seven, 
Pierre Oliver Vallette in eighth place from Broadband in ninth as Xavier Sanchez rounds out your top ten. Worth noting, nine drivers are in 30 seconds of your race winner. James West, Will Ford, and Maxine Dutchman rounds out your field as we welcome you then to the Bosey post-race show here from the Porsche All-Stars race. Incredible racing once again. We're going to get ourselves some interviews in just a couple of moments' time. And, well... Matt, what we've, what we've really seen here today will set us up incredibly when we start thinking about the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup, which is going to be, well, coverage kicks off in just about 10 minutes time for that. But what we've seen here is that you've got to be patient. Over-aggression doesn't work. And we've seen the drivers who have been patient and methodical all season long rising to the top as the race progressed. Yeah, absolutely. You, you can't throw Hail Marys around Montreal, um, not without severely damaging a car and probably ending your race in the process. So you're right, patience pays off, being very calculated, methodical, setting up passes, laps in advance even, trying to just get people off the line, figure out where you have an advantage, how to exploit that advantage on the driver in front of you. And it makes for great racing. I find it very tactical in that sense. So. Um, Definitely a fantastic circuit in that regard. Last race, potentially, we see from the Cayman in this series because we still don't know what the final race at Monza will be. There's a potential to be any of the three cars we will have used because we're going to be switching over to the RSR next time out, which is uh, one of my absolute favorite cars in all of iRacing, if I'm completely honest. But uh, yeah, very, very cool to see this car around this circuit. And uh, Lawrence Vanthor, someone who's actually, as I mentioned, racing with the Canadian team this year, FAF in the cup, well, excuse me, in the GT3 cars, or different cup cars, but around Montreal was a new experience. And the first race, cold tires caught out, but made up for it on the reverse grid. How was the day overall for you? Um, a bit stressy because a bit of a background story. We, I recently moved, so I uh, took my sim apart and it's still in the same boxes ever since. <laughs> and that's now like four or five months. So I'm actually at my brother's place. Uh, practicing and, and racing so uh, I hope it was not uh, it wasn't too bad but yeah you could see in race one I got a bit caught out on the, on the cold tires even though Matt Campbell he wrote me a message watch out with it but apparently I didn't take that too serious but uh, no, it was fun it was uh, it was nice I like driving in Montreal I've never been there in real life uh, I hope one day but uh, it was a fun evening yeah, that's actually one of the things I was thinking about during this race is, is Montreal's kind of inaccessible to a lot of international drivers aside from Formula One, and then it does a lot of sort of uh, Canadian championships as support races. Sim racing is kind of cool in that regard because it gives people an opportunity to drive circuits they never otherwise would. And what are kind of the top circuits that you wish you could drive in your life that you haven't? Um, I've been lucky enough to have been to a lot of them. Um, but honestly, Montreal is, is definitely one one of them up there. Um, honestly, all the others can't think about much of... of I put you on the spot there, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for me, the, the greatest tracks are Nürburgring, Bathurst, a lot of tracks in, in North America. Uh, yeah, Montreal is still missing, so... That's the only one who pops up in my mind at the moment. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. How is the, uh, how is, how's your brother's sim compared to yours in terms of adapting? Is it similar? Um, I've uh, he has a sim tech sim uh, with a precision sim steering uh, air engineering. Uh, I have the same steering wheel at home, and I'm getting the same sim because it's a Belgium company, and I uh, we made a little agreement together. Uh, so I'm, I'm getting the exact same thing uh, just uh, next week, <laughs> probably. So, uh, but I, I drove his one last year, and and I enjoyed it a lot. So that's why i had the excuse when he was quicker than me it was a sim not not me so. <laughs> there's always got to be one excuse what happens if he's still quicker when you get yours um i don't want to answer that question <laughs> <laughs> fair just go to his house and just steal his altogether. uh we, we chances we'll see you again in this series now that you're uh, hopefully gonna have your set up and and got a taste for it yeah, sure, absolutely. I'm uh, waiting for the next uh, invitation. Uh, I should be ready with my gear uh, next week, and um, I'll be spending some time in America, obviously, for for racing. But uh, I'm always up for uh, for these things. They're fun um, and uh, helps me train my concentration a bit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And obviously, like you say, over in North America, doing IMSA this year uh, with Faf, who's back in the series full time. Obviously, COVID kind of sidelined them a little bit last year, being one of the only Canadian teams, but How's that shaping up? Because obviously they had an incredible, I guess, rookie or debut campaign in, in 2019. Um, 
Very good for me. It's obviously a new team. Uh, last year, I was in the, in the works program in the RSR uh, that unfortunately had stopped. Uh, but I'm, I'm really happy to be with Fav because they, it's a, a small group of people which are highly motivated, uh, have high knowledge and, and know what they're doing. And um, you know, if you're coming from a big group like a works team and you go in a, in a, in a smaller group because it's, it's customer racing, it's sometimes even a bit more fun because you know there's less amount of people to work with a tighter bunch uh, a little bit more relaxed um but i enjoyed working with them a lot and i was I was quite impressed but i by their level of, of working and i'm they have i think plans for the future and i'm, and I'm sure they uh, they can they can achieve them and for now for the for this year is uh our our goal is that All right. Well, listen, congratulations on today, Lawrence, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon in the future. And best of luck with Faf. Uh, great race from him. As you said, cold tires caught him out, so uh, did recover from that. Uh, like I said, they adapt fast, those pro guys. But someone who is always impressive, uh, very good wheel-to-wheel -wheel today, Mr. Dan Suzuki. <laughs> I don't know how you pull off wheel-to-wheel -wheel with that Emery going around the outside in turn two and not hit the wall, but you were, you were all over it. Yeah, it was, it was super fun. First race, second race, good battles, especially the second race, like with Boya and first race with Emily, six laps of nice fighting. Lost the position, unfortunately, but it was a very good pass by Emily. I got to give that to her. So all good. It was super fun. Finally, a good weekend for me in the K-Man. <laughs> yeah, very consistent in both races, obviously, getting up to, uh, what was, I think, fourth or third in the first race in the end. But either way, yeah, uh, yeah I think it was third. Sorry, excuse me. And then obviously yeah. now second in the, in the feature, which means you had to battle back through the field as well. Were you, were you worried with Montreal that maybe it was going to be a little more chaotic at the start? Mm, honestly, no. Montreal is one of my favorite tracks. I just, I just love attacking the sausage curbs with those cars. Um, but yeah, no, it was, was really good fun here. <clears throat> yeah, awesome. And now, obviously, we switch to the RSR, which is going to be oh, a whole wait. other beast. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, are you looking forward to that? I think most people <laughs> like that car. Yeah, RSR are one of my favorite cars in iRacing. I can't wait to try that. It would be, would be really awesome, I guess. So. Yeah, and obviously heading to some of the faster circuits as well, where the downforce will pay off, and and it's a it's it's definitely a car you can attack mm -hmm. with. I think uh, I think obviously we've got some pretty famous circuits coming up later in the year as we continue to close down on this championship. What's what's the one you're looking forward to the most? Nor you know, Nordschleife, Le Mans, Spa. Mm, for me, probably Spa. Interesting. Yeah, that's fair. Interestingly, for me, I don't like Spa, but that's because I'm <laughs> okay. So that's that's <laughs> that's Spa is probably the track I raced the most on, and uh, yeah, always, always nice there. Well, perfect. Well, hey, great result today at great racing as always. That was a ton Thank of fun you. to watch. Yeah, had a lot of fun driving. Absolutely. And Emily Jones joins us now as well in third place, battling back through. Obviously, got the sprint race victory as well. Emily, I need to talk about that first lap of the feature race, though. How did you make it through that carnage? I don't know. I just kind of committed. I I saw the gap. I think I even said drive through it on, on stream when it happened. Um, it was terrifying. Like, normally you can kind of see these crashes happening and spot a gap opening, but there was, like, no gap. It was just cars everywhere, and I'm like, oh, God. Um, it just, yeah, I, I picked a gap and went for it. Well, it worked, obviously, and uh, you were fantastic at actually picking your moments around this track. How hard is Montreal? Because it always seems like you can pass, but it's never easy to complete. Yeah, it's it's a tricky track to race. I, I think you have to go over the curbs, like, a lot, and you get really close to slowdowns. You're going right up to the wall. The engine sounds bouncing off like a Vuvuzela. It's it's crazy. Um, I think in terms of passing people, I really struggle today, and I think that's why it it took so long for me to make it back through to the front in the feature race. Um, but yeah, I kept going the outside and people would defend the inside. And I think you really need to get like a run on somebody and get on the inside of them to get past. So it's difficult, but it was, it was okay. Yeah, very good. Well, hey, great results again. Uh, a win and a, and a podium in the feature looking consistent as always. Congratulations. Great racing. Thank you. And obviously, Will, that means we get to talk to Yardie because this man was uh, animated. He's been looking excellent in the Cayman. This is our last week in it for now, at least. We're not sure where we'll end up. But Yardie, I saw you hold your breath a few times on the Wall of Champions. Uh, you were pretty <laughs> animated. You were all over the place in that race in terms of uh, emotion, but very consistent in terms of what the car was looking like. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that because I'm at the same time doing some other race. So the preparation for today was literally 30 minutes before the race. Wow. And I really struggled a lot. And in quality, I ruined all my free laps. And then somehow in the first race, I, I went to P4. So it was really, really good. And, uh, and in this race, I had some amazing fights. It was really cool. I just could feel I was losing compared to Road Atlanta, a lot of pace in some of the places. I, for example, didn't trust at all the last chicane. Every single time I tried to push it a little bit, I just touched the wall or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, the walls are scary here. Uh, are you looking forward to maybe jumping into the RSR? A lot faster, obviously, but very different to drive. I'm super looking forward because the car is like so much faster, so much more downforce and the sound, you know? Yeah. Like, so yeah, <laughs> looking forward super much, especially for Le Mans and Nordschleife. It's gonna be crazy. Yeah, good call. The longest circuits. North Life's always a hoot. Uh, well, best of luck there, obviously, because I think that's a track that anything can happen. But a great race today. 30 minutes preparation. I'm impressed by that. That's super well done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, man. Incredible. There you go. Yeah, I will. That is pretty incredible. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. I'd still be trying to pull myself out of the wall for my first warm-up lap. <laughs> Yeah, I was just thinking, by the way, off, uh, whilst you were doing the, the great interview stuff that like you always do, um, I think that where Emily was uh, making that move to the right-hand side, I might be mistaken here, but I think it's one of the narrowest points of racetrack in all of iRacing, because you've got, what, about half a metre on either side of grass, and then a big concrete wall? I don't think there's many places narrower than that. Yeah, aside from maybe some of the actual street circuits, but it's also <laughs> narrow in terms, I don't know what the actual... Uh, edge to edge of the circuit would be there, but because it's such a quick chicane that you're, you're straight lining it. So to go wheel yeah. to wheel through it, you're relying on a lot of trust in the other driver um, to open up that space. It's so hard to do. So definitely in terms of racing space, I'd say it's one of the narrowest for sure. Yeah. Um, hopefully we'll get a quick look at the standings before we head ourselves over to a quick break. Don't forget, don't go anywhere. Countdown brought to you by Tag Heuer is coming up next as we're going to get ourselves ready for round number six of the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup by iRacing. Before we head ourselves over to that, Matt, what's your final thoughts on this? The All-Stars race, another great two races, entertaining for outs. I've act you know what, I I've driven the Cayman and I like the Cayman and I I've always kind of thought, yeah, it's a good little, little car, but this made me think it's awesome for racing. I mean, I've, I've kind of underrated it in terms of how great it would be uh, as a spec series in itself, and I want to get in one more and more on iRacing, so I think people should go sign up and get in that car. What a what a hoot that thing is to watch around these tracks. Don't forget, for, if you want to join iRacing, you can do so right now. Head over to iRacing.com and check out um, well, offers for new and existing members. In two weeks' time, we're going to be heading ourselves over to Spa Francochamps, and it's going to be where we're going to have our first race in the Porsche 911 RSR. It's going to be our car of choice in the All-Star Series for the next three races. In the meanwhile, don't go anywhere because Countdown to Green brought to you by Tag Heuer for the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup coming up next.
welcome to round number six of the Porsche Takoya Esports Super Cups as half the season is in the books of half a season less to go. Here at Circuit Shield Villeneuve, some are desperate to get back into the game and for others, it's a case of just trying to keep momentum. Australians, Joshua Rogers is flying high at the top of the standings as he hunts down his second championship with an 89 point lead over American Mitchell De Jong. But we all know this racetrack is one where an entire season can begin to unravel in just a couple of moments. Before we kick off our coverage on Countdown to Green, presented by Tag Heuer, let's look back at what happened just last week at Road Atlanta. Road Atlanta. This circuit, tight, fast, flowing. There's going to be some drama. Green flag, and we are off for the sprint race in the Porsche Sakoya Esports Super Cup. Rogers has moved to the front ahead of Collins. Dane Warren wants to get into second place. He wants to start moving forward in this one. We've got side-by-side -side action. Maxim Ramstein involved in this one. A little bit of rubbing there with Aya Changuvan. But at the front, Joshua Rogers for his third sprint race victory here. And look at that. He took a deep breath there. He was under pressure throughout that race. This track is relentless, isn't it? It just keeps coming at you. This feature race is underway for 20 laps of action here. And a oh. big, big accident. That's Alejandro Sanchez in the background. Oh, Jobs involved in that one. Jobs around. That's your champion from 2020. Look who's turned up to party here, Matt. Mitchell Dion, he's tagged on now. And Ellis Jr. is making a move into 10A. Is this car close enough to go back at it? I think he's going to try. Dan Warren's involved in this. He gets caught up by the checkup. They need to be careful not to trip over each other. One little mistake contact between Holtzman and Williams. Williams into yeah. the Presser in one. Here's Ellis Jr. looking to make the move. De Young to the front got himself to the lead of this queue. Tembe, De Young's around. De Young's made contact. And here comes Rogers. He's going to have the inside for the final corner. There's a little room. Ellis Jr. runs wide into the wall. Look at that. Rogers, he cannot believe it. My goodness. Next time out, Montreal, Quebec. The fabulous Circuit de Villeneuve. My goodness, indeed, as Will Vincent here, along with the guy on the call, Paul Smith and Connery Maddock and Paul. I think the only way we can talk about that last round was drama and chaos. Yeah, dramatic was the word I was thinking of, absolutely. It's been a, it was a sensational race, action-packed, and, uh, well, I mean, go from one tricky track to another, this is certainly today is going to give us something. And Connery, very quickly, we talked about last round being exciting. This track, Montreal, we can expect almost exactly the same. Yeah, absolutely. Not a lot of room to maneuver out there if there's going to be an incident in the mid-pack that we usually tend to see with a little bit of the kerfuffles that go on down there, then it can cause a big, big train reaction further back because there would be cars scattered across the circuit. So it's, it's going to have to be quite heads-up driving and avoidance driving from those cars further behind. We're going to talk about some of the drivers who have done well or maybe not so well so far this season. In a moment's time, we're going to get our Ted Kravitz kind of half-term report cards out. But but before we do that, let's have a little look at the first half of the season and how we've gotten to where we are as we enter part number two here at Montreal. Two thousand twenty-one is here. Well, we're in for an incredible season. Never say never in the Porsche Tycoon Esports Super Cup. We are back at Interlagos. My goodness, what a drive! Side by side for the lead. They're still side by side. He is out! 
counting your Senna and your Prost. We've had some tremendous racing here. Contact there! Here comes Rogers down the inside! Well, that's where we were. Let's talk about then a couple of these drivers. We're going to start with Connery um, because you've been looking very closely at Mitchell De Jong all season long. He's currently second place in the championship and he's had some good races. However, one or two little results is what's kept him from really battling for the championship as close as he could have been. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be a pretty difficult gap for him to surmount to the main man of the moment right now, Joshua Rogers, who has been completely exemplary throughout the entirety of this season. He had that one little issue in the main race of uh, Interlagos, uh, but the rest of it has all been first places and second places. And, you know, it's just a, a very, very calm and consistent season so far for Josh that Mitchell just seemingly hasn't figured out how to deal with just yet. Of course, he got uh, spun out uh, from, a, uh, from a podium position in that last race at uh, Road Atlanta, uh, which was unfortunate while he was trying to battle in amongst those top three places. So, you know, he's going to hurt in terms of the points deficit to that. Now Joshua Rogers is about 89 points ahead. That is actually more than uh, what you get for a completely perfect uh, uh, race day. So if you get the race win in the, in the sprint race, the qualifying win, or also obviously the feature race win, you get 85 points. So Josh could potentially sit this one out and still be the leader coming into the next round. That's how much of a gap he has. Of course, though, Paul, Josh Rogers won't do that. We know that one to be factual and true. Um, and Josh Rogers, of course, hunting down his second championship in the Porsche Takoy Esports Super Cup. He won the first season back in 2019, lost out to Sebastian Job in 2020. But my word, Rogers has been on fire um, it's in the second, in, sorry, in the 2021 season. Yeah, he's been absolutely sensational, as Connery uh, pointed out. He had one issue in the series so far this season. That was in the feature race at Interlagos. But of course, the rest of the time, he's finished first and he's finished second. That's as simple as that. That is the reason that he finds himself on 348 points. He has had an unbelievable season so far this year, year so far. And... He's always in and around that championship battle. This car seems to suit his driving, suit his style. And, uh, well, he's, he's somebody that has got the big bullseye on him and everybody's got to try and hit the bullseye. And we've also got battles going on just outside your top 10. We always start to think at this part of the season about those drivers looking to attain their license for next season. We've got Patrick Holt in 18th place. Jeff Yassi, they're separated by three points, 17th, 18th place. Martin Cronke in 19th to 76 points. Diego Pinto, P20 with 71. Johan Haar for 68 points in 21st place. Very quickly, Connery. One bad result for any of those drivers they could have a real struggle as we get closer to wrapping up the season. Not all that many points on offer now as we tick down the rounds until we get to Bonza and that grand finale. So you're absolutely right, Will. For those drivers that are, that are in a position to be, uh, have basically being at risk to, of being inside, outside the top 20, which qualifies automatically into next season, this is a big, big couple of rounds for them. And uh, it's so difficult when you're in that position because usually when you're on the border of the top 20 like that, usually you're qualifying mid-pack and you're having to deal with uh, the amount of stuff that's happening both ahead of you and behind you as well. So it's very, very difficult to get consistent results when you're in that position. Um, only the best are able to do that, but uh, it, it's kind of understandable that those drivers have put themselves in that position. Well, thank you very much for watching Countdown to Green, presented by Tag Heuer, qualifying for the sixth round of the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup is coming up after these messages. Green flag drops, away we go from the start of this final feature race for the Porsche Esports Super Cup. Brilliant launch. 40 of the best sim races. $200,000 on the line. Who will rise to the challenge? 
This is Racing for Immortality. This is Esports Personified. This is the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup. Hello and welcome then to the halfway point of the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Supercup by iRacing. And well, what a venue we have got for you today. The Circuit Juvenerve here in Quebec, Canada. And myself, Paul Smith and Matt Trevitt will be bringing you all the coverage here of this track and of this event. But uh, Matt, I mean, this is, this is one of my favorite tracks in the world of motorsport. I don't know about yourself, but this should be some excellent racing today. Yeah, I, I, I'm a little biased, so uh, <laughs> it is certainly one of the tracks that I consider to be an unbelievably unique circuit in a lot of ways as well, and that it's a permanent structure, but uh, considered a street course, kind of like Albert Park in that way, but it, it is one of the best circuits in racing, and in terms of atmosphere as well, anyone who's ever been there for the Grand Prix weekends will have undoubtedly left with memorable impressions of Porsche Cup as a support race because it's one of the best races of the weekend, if not the best race of the weekend each year. And it's just incredibly close to downtown, which means it's 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 just awesome environment, atmosphere, and the fanfare is excellent. So it's a very, very cool place to, to be in a motor race. Well, let's take a look at where exactly we are in the world then. So we are going to be racing around the, uh, the man-made island of Ile Notre Dame uh, here on the... Uh, in the, just, as I say, just off downtown, uh, there's the Olympic Rowing Lake next to the circuit there. 2.71 miles in length. Very flat circuit. There's very little undulation here around this venue. But Matt, you know, you've know, you you've been here. What What's the best places really for drivers to be able to make some moves? Yeah, it's actually, interestingly enough, sat in the St. Lawrence Seaway as well, which is arguably the most famous river in uh, waterway in Canada. So very historic in that sense. In terms of overtakes, just as I said in the All-Star Race, it's a track of opportunity, but not necessarily as easy as that seems. Um, lots of braking, one of the hardest braking circuits in the world. Uh, definitely one of the hardest braking circuits uh, in terms of percentage of brake time and the percentage of brake pressure that will be in, in the entire season. Turn one, you're definitely going to see some opportunity there. Into the hairpins, the other obvious one. And then, of course, into the final chicane, turns 13 and 14, which obviously is uh, cushioned by the wall. Or I say cushioned, it's rather a hard cushion at that. But the wall of champions, which many of Chris and over the years in Formula One and, and various other series and might claim some victims today. It didn't in the All-Star race, but this shot right here actually at turns uh, three and four, the first chicane complex can be very tricky as well because that inside dip, it's where Sebastian Vettel in 2019 cut the circuit and was given a rather controversial in some people's opinion, I'll leave it there, but uh, five second penalty. That wall can also be very, very punishing and uh, just a very quick anecdote on that, because Gilles Villeneuve used to go through there, which obviously this circuit is named after, and would leave a mark on the wall, and he would hit it every single lap, but there was one mark. That's how close and accurate you have to be around this circuit to be fast, and there's a look at how uh, accurate Josh Rogers has been this season, I think, Paul. Yeah, he's been absolutely sensational. As Connery pointed out in the countdown show, he could miss this week and still be leading the championship at the end of the week. That's how much of a gap he's got out there. Charlie Collins has been a, a really interesting one uh, to join the grid this year. Finds himself in third place, the rookie, ahead of Kelvin Ellis Jr. Uh, Dame Warren, fifth place. And Sebastian Job, 148 points off of the championship lead. It's going to be a tall order. He needs things to happen to those in front of him to have any chance of trying to retain his championship here. But uh, if, if, if ever there was a track to come to where things could happen to your rivals, Matt, it's this circuit. What a perfect place to start the second half of the season. You're absolutely right in that this is an opportunity track, but you have to consider that Sebastian's on the back foot and has to take more risk to make up those places, and it can go both ways. And I think we've seen that happen to him quite a few times this season. Unfortunately, Interlagos, technical difficulties. He was uh, dropped from the feature race, which certainly hurt for points overall, but there's been a lot of other incidences where he's caught up in other people's drama, where he's necessarily, uh, not necessarily being as cautious because he's trying to make positions compared to his rival in Josh Rogers. So yes, he needs some luck on his side, but he needs to be very careful as well. And it's a very tricky thing to do, but 
yeah, I expect we'll see a few cars and walls around this place by the end of the day. 40 cars on the grid, definitely going to see some drama. Yeah, it's going to be uh, dramatic, that's for sure. Um, with Sebastian Job, one of those incidents happened at the uh, Villeneuve chicane at Imola. So, uh, I mean, <laughs> we, we find ourselves at Circuit Gilles Villeneuve. So, uh, you know, hopefully things turn out a little bit better at these chicanes uh, here today. But we are getting set for qualifying. Drivers are getting themselves out there on track, getting the cars prepared for the first of their qualifying laps here. 12 minutes to set yourself your qualifying times. And Brian Lockwood up on screen. Uh, the American heading down into one of those big braking zones that Matt was on about into the hairpin and then you've got to get the power down perfectly out of that corner because he carried that speed all the way down this back straight. Yeah, and it's interesting to see as well over the years there's been different approaches to the corner. It's not so much about getting the apex right. Some people late apex it. Some people don't even want to close their steering that much so they can get on the power more gradually. But it's all about the exit. Whatever's comfortable for you, get the exit because that's such a long straightaway. And look at how much curb 13 and 14 present you with those big sausage curbs that the cars smash over. And it's very... Uh, gratifying and, and you love the way it feels when you get it right but even a fraction wrong and you're into the wall on the outside of course the wall of champions well here's lockwood and just jumping off of the uh, the curb on the apex of two heading towards three and four that chicane that we were on about where there can be issues through there hop over the curbs you have to use the curbs around here back in sliding out there then through five into six you're braking as you're turning into six here. That's uh, a tricky one. And these curbs, especially that left curb at turn six, tends to make your car hop. You've really got to be careful with the setup and how these it's, cars deal with those set those it, chicanes. In the Cayman, five would be no problem flat. In, in, and this, just to talk through this, is this particular six and seven setup as well. Massive curb. He actually straddles at that time, Brian Lockwood. We saw a lot of the Caymans kind of bouncing off that as well, but very easy to get wrong. Um, five in these cars, the back end will start to dance a bit, especially early in the race on cold tires when we get to that. So keep in mind, and that kind of changes the way you set up for six. And you're right, you're still kind of turning on the way into the braking point. So unlike this, the braking for turn 10, the hairpin where you're slamming onto the brakes and then letting off as the car decreases so it's not to lock up and then allowing your turn in, you're actually going to be gradual onto the brakes in six, trying to get hard braking to get it slowed down and lifting as you turn in gradually at, at, the, at the actual turning point. So it's very technical in that sense in terms of what your foot's doing. Yeah, you can see Graham Carroll focusing, looking for his braking point, getting the braking right into the final chicane. Launch the car over the curbs. You really need to be aggressive through that final chicane because you can get caught out by the speed, uh, by not having the speed down the start and finish straight because turn two here well turn one here into turn two is an overtaking opportunity for people first lap times are coming in by the way dame warren just found himself to provisional pole position although at uh, times as i say is coming in thick and fast at the moment josh rogers well there's no surprise finds himself provisionally on pole i say have no surprise he hasn't been on pole for the last few rounds so uh, he's been uh, not so much the king of qualifying this season one of the interesting circuits as well that the qualifying lap does have a slightly different line than the racing lap and it's it's marginal but coming down the front straight typically coming off the wall of champions you start to edge the car back over to the left of circuit because there is before turn one actually a tor turn that's not numbered and it's a bit of a kink that you want to get parallel with to get the braking done to then turn left into one and in qualifying you don't want to go left because you want to stay right and keep this track as short as possible um, to get the best time so it's kind of interesting that sometimes in qualifying you see every second lap be more important and you can see it here they're hugging to the right as we as we look on right now is normally in the race you're going to be going a little more left for that kink just into the turn one breaking point yeah pekka told him and then then finishing his qualifying lap the finished driver other drivers out there just getting themselves prepared so we're in that sort of middle zone now where some drivers are, have taken to go back to the pits get themselves some fresh tires and start again and uh, well the 107 Thomas Tetela getting himself prepared getting his car and tires to temperature and into the working range also getting those brakes up to temperature as well. Here's a driver who's been uh, really doing well in qualifying Sindra set source. As, uh, well, we look through Ricardo Castroleto yet to set a qualifying time here. And we've only got half of the time remaining in qualifying for Ricardo. So he needs to just get, a, get the hammer down here. 
Yeah, interestingly enough, you talk about X's kind of canceling qualifying laps in iRacing. It's not so much X's here, it's actually just straight up missing corners with the breaking point. You could get an X here in six and seven. Definitely the way these guys are straddling the curve on, on particularly in turn seven can catch you out, but it's also, you know, the, the, the final chicane. You get that wrong, you run over the curve, you're gonna actually just full on get a slowdown penalty. So it's kind of no in between. The margin for error is very slight. And that's something to keep in mind in the race as well. If someone gets deep on the brakes and misses an overtaking opportunity into the final chicane, we know how close these guys run. Going down that front straight, you've got a lift, give up a time penalty, you're gonna lose three or four spots. So definitely something these guys have to keep in mind. Well, this is one driver here who's not had the greatest of seasons, Alejandro Sanchez, as he goes through the first couple of corners. He will not be happy with how things have been going this season. After challenging in the first, in the second season of this uh, championship in 2020, he's pulled back a bit, down to ninth place. He's only got one podium so far this season. He'll be looking to try and start off the second half of the season on a real positive. And look at the concentration look at the focus that he's got there on track he he knows that he's got to hit those apexes he's got to hit his breaking points absolutely perfect into the brakes again and look at him he's looking for the apex so that's what all of these drivers will be doing out there today yeah you're absolutely right third place championship last year drama right at the offset for for this season as he got eighth in the first sprint race, which meant that he had pole for the reverse top eight in the first feature race. But then as the battle kind of unfolded, it was Josh Rogers, the only mistake he's made all season, Josh Rogers, that actually took him out in, in the process of losing the back end of the, the curbs at Interlagos. So uh, ever since then, it's just been downhill. It's just been a very tumultuous season and uh, a lot of bad luck for Alejandro Sanchez. He and Sebastian, both the, the other, obviously Sebastian, the champion from last year, and Alejandro, the other challenger, other than Josh Rogers, and they're both kind of having a bit of a struggle this time around. So definitely wants to rebound, as you say, halfway point. This is usually one of the mental resets that people look for, get that get that midpoint out of the way and then refocus for the end of the championship. And we've got a very different end as well. We've got a lot of the longer circuits coming up, some of the more technical circuits coming up. So a chance to do that and really focus the mentality. Well, Sanchez finds himself at the moment in fifth place. So that's a good qualifying spot for him so far. But with three and a half minutes remaining, of course, in qualifying here, once that clock strikes zero, that's the end of it. You do not get to finish your lap time. Sebastian Job up into second place now in qualifying, but there's still over just over a tenth behind Josh Rogers, who has parked the car. He's uh, had a, a, he's done all that he feels that he can. Here's Aitran Guvan, one of the drivers uh, new to the season, and of course the driver who races in the uh, Porsche Mobile One Super Cup as well. He's yet to set a qualifying time in this qualifying session so far, so the pressure's on Aitran to do that. Zach Campbell to the top of your qualifying standings, wow. provisional pole position for the American, the rookie. And, uh, well, what a sensational drive from him. He wouldn't be the first rookie to get pole position this season because Charlie Collins got pole position last time out. But that is setting is setting his mark and setting his stall out right there. Just to know, yeah, and Aich and Guven, you're right, races in Mobile One Super Cup. It's kind of the uh, little subtle homage to that by having the 911 number because obviously there's no factory Porsche drivers or works drivers in this series. But... Uh, He's got the uh, the official number just by virtue of being in that series. What a lap from Zach Campbell right now. That's almost 0 0.05 faster than Josh Rogers. I know that seems not like nothing, but in this series, that's significant to be over top of Josh. Who, by the way, ever since we've highlighted his qualifying performances and having yeah. something like 18 out of 21 pole positions uh, in the history of the series, he's not had pole positions. So maybe we've jinxed him. I'm not sure. I don't know what it is, but we've done something. Commentator's curse lives on here. Jamie Flute, by the way, the Northern Irishman, third place on the grid provisionally. There's only, I don't think there's that many drivers who can set a qualifying lap. Johan Hart, I believe, is the last one that can potentially set any decent qualifying lap out there. So we're watching him down towards the hairpin and he's yet to set a qualifying time. And he's seen his compatriots from the Apex Racing team get there first and third in qualifying. So uh, we know that they've got pace in that car and that setup. He needs to extract that and extract it cleanly as well. Sebastian Job's only been in, in the top five in qualifying twice this season, arguably another reason why his season hasn't unfolded the way he would have liked. 
certainly had a battle a lot of times that cost him dearly. This time he sits currently in fourth position. So this is already looking like a chance for him to be in a much better position to strike. Again, you said it, he needs a little bit of luck this weekend, but that's a better start as Yonart comes across the line, our final driver to do so. He, oh, we jumped on with Brian Lockwood. Is he still on a lap? If I got this wrong in my timing. I, I think he's best to just get as many laps in as possible to get his eye in really for the race uh, as he's out there. He's not going to be able to make it to the end, I don't feel. Uh, although he is, he is on his... Uh, yeah, it's gonna, yeah, it's, it's gonna be close. Whether it'll improve, we don't know. But yeah, Johan Hart found himself in 18th with that qualifying time. Four drivers without a qualifying time. Here's Josh Thompson, Ricardo Rico, Salva Talens, and Carlos Benalosa, who was heartbroken with what happened last time out at Road Atlanta. And uh, he only just missed out on getting a good point haul as it comes across the line. Well, it's an improvement for Lockwood but uh, it's not moving him up the field. So that is going to be the end of qualifying there for the sprint race here. And now we'll be able to give you the grid then. So it's the American Zach Campbell on the front row of the grid with Josh Rogers, the Northern Irishman, Jamie Fluke, alongside the Englishman, Sebastian Job, Dane Warren from Australia, and Alejandro Sanchez from Spain. And out your front row, three rows. Diogo Pinto, Pinto, fantastic, fantastic yeah. performance from Pinto alongside Ellis Jr., De Young, Boatloop, uh, Tetela, and Collins. Max Benneker once again finds himself down in row seven. You're on heart in row nine in the end, as we saw. Massive Kronka, row 11, alongside Jack Sedgwick. There to experienced drivers in the series as we keep on going down that grid. Uh, La Fuente 13th, Pekka Toyman, uh, 13th row, should I say, Pekka Toyman on the 15th row. And then the back of the grid, drivers who did not score a time, Talens Thompson, Penalosa, and Rico round out your grid here today. It is a 36 car grid here, so we are missing one or two drivers, but the action is going to be fast paced and frenetic. Very quickly then, Matt, who's, who's he taking this uh, sprint race? Yeah, I was going to point out Pinto just for being in a reasonably uh, good position for him. He's aggressive, but I, I think you've got to look at guys like Zach Campbell on pole, a rookie on pole. That is super impressive. And we've seen him in the battles all year long, but this is a great chance for him to score some, some huge points. Drivers find themselves on the grid and they're getting themselves set for the sprint race here in the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup. Calm before the storm here. As the drivers will then start looking up to those lights. It's the second half of the season. The green flag is in the air and away we go for 10 laps of action here in round number six of the Porsche Tycora Esports Super Cup down towards the first chicane and it's Rogers and Fluke side by side. Job trying to find space to move up into third. Rest of your field working their way through. Looks to be a pretty clean start. Castroledo has dropped all the way down to the back of the field. So an instant. Oh, oh there is a big instant there at the first chicane. And that is Jamie Fluke from third place on the grid, all the way down to the back of the field. As we see him cut back through to try and rejoin, that is a huge heartbreak for him. Best qualifying of the season. Finally in for a good position, and I think just got tapped into a spin. And I, I give everyone credit for not hitting him, but he did at least exit stage right far enough that no one was really in the line of fire. So back at the front, battle continues, getting too wide into six and seven. This will be desperate down to our first big breaking point of the lap as they're up to speed, finally heading into turn number 10. Absolutely, it's Campbell, Rogers, Job at the front, and there's a little bit of a gap then to Dame Warren, who's in fourth place. Alandra Sanchez and Pinto, fifth and sixth for them. As they're heading through the hairpin, we've got higher smoke in the background uh, down at the hairpin. So one driver has had an issue out there as they go down. Oh, In fact, multiple one. cars having issues out there. Watch your rejoins there, fellas, as they uh, get back up and running there. Alexander Walters, I think, was one of those drivers involved. Uh, Fenelosa and Fluke trying to recover, uh, catch up to the back. And look at Rogers now. Rogers trying to make the move to the outside. That'll give him the inside for two. 
and Zach Campbell, oh, he's shown him the inside for two, and that's going to allow Sebastian Job to have a little look. No move made by Job, but it's Rogers to the head of the field here on the start of lap two. That's all set up out of the final chicane. Not a great run onto the front straight by Zach Campbell. And as a result, Josh Rogers gets in perfect position to go, and he knows he has to go. Sebastian Jones, the next in the line. Jamie Fluke spinning out on the first lap allows Sebastian to get a gift to be all over the position he needs. So Josh wants to get distance. Josh wants to make this very difficult for Sebastian as we look on board with each of them, or at least rather into the rooms of each of them and see the emotions on the face. Sebastian, eyes forward. Josh, as calm as ever, takes into the apex of turn six. They all straddle the curb up and over. And uh, this is just going to be such a challenge all the way through for the, the mentality of the two drivers rather than the speed. We know the speed's there, but with the huge advantage that, oh, and we might get a look here from Sebastian, but the huge advantage that Josh has means it's all pressure onto the Red Bull driver. And good read from Zach Campbell. Left space, left room. Further back, oh. Max Benecki gets into the back of I'm not sure exactly who that is. That's but Charlie Collins. Draw, but that is Charlie Collins, and that's a driver who's been very good all year in his rookie campaign. And he's doing the right thing, not moving, letting the other drivers know that he's there. And Collins up and over, and he is dealt down to the back of your field. So action and drama happening in the sprint race. And of course, the top eight, they set themselves the reverse grid. The rest of the field trying to get themselves a position for the starting grid of the feature race and to get as many points as possible here in the sprint race. But there, that queue of cars, it's Tommy Oostgaard leading it with Max Benneke, Sintra Set Source, Graham Carroll, Johan Hart, Diogo Pinto, who's dropped down the order, has pinned on that last lap. Jeremy Bootsler, Fibel Casabon. Jeff Giazzi and Pekka Toyman all in a queue of traffic from 9th down to 18th here, Matt. So these guys, you've got guys trying to work the way past Tommy here. Yeah, Graham Carroll's made up about four spots from his, he's up to 12th from 16th off the start. So he seems to be benefiting from a lot of his contact and drama in that pack. And undoubtedly, Maximilian Benecke is going to have a bit of damage on the front of that car. So he might be someone that could potentially be a bottleneck in this. Maybe watch for his pace as we continue on with this battle. Ustgard in front as well, trying to break free from it, but so far unable to do so. And the draft is absolutely a factor around Montreal. Down that back straightaway, you're within a second of the car in front, gonna be a huge toe. So that certainly is something that Ustgard wants to try and get back on De Jong, but right now that cap is a little bit too much. Oh, oh the a big drama. That's Jan Hart at the hairpin we saw up and over. Through shot there, Benneke, he's not phased by that because, uh, well, it's in his rearview mirror, he doesn't care. He's looking forward, he's looking at Tommy Ostgard in front of him. That was, I don't know what's going on no, with that I, I, I think this is happening. This, this is poor driving standards. I, I think people are, again, I said it, there's, you don't have to be on the apex to get a good drive off of turn 10. It's a tight corner. Some people come in a little bit later to get a latent straight line. Some people hold it wider to get on the throttle more evenly with having less steering input. And I think the cars behind are being a little bit too desperate right now, and I don't think it's proper driving standards. They're getting their nose in, we're seeing that overlap, the wheel-to-wheel -wheel hit, and then they, they, the car in front rolls, and it's... Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. I think there might be some reviews done into some of the driving standards so far in this race. The students well, are definitely going to be busy. They're, they're, going to be, uh, they're going to be busy, that's for sure, but people who are busy at the front of the field, Joshua Rogers, he's got a 0.7 of a second lead ahead of Sebastian Job in second place. That Campbell then is having to almost be a little bit defensive from Dane Warren behind him with Alejandro Sanchez at the back of it. Here's a view from the visor, visor cam, the Vodafone visor cam of Sebastian Job, and Sebastian right now, Finds himself in that in that drafting distance there. So he is going to pick up the slipstream of Joshua Rogers in front of him. As they go through the hairpin, you can see just the gentle application of the throttle. As soon as you're confident on those rear tires having adhesion, bang, power goes fully down. Give yourself the launch out of the hairpin. But right now, Job, he is gaining with the slipstream. But Rogers just seems to have it so good through the chicanes in the first half of the lap here. Interesting to know as well, and it's it's something maybe I'll have to ask post race and should have thought of sooner. But in Formula One, they do a lot of brake bias changing in the course of a lap here because, like turn one where we're heading now, you're going to trail brake it into the apex, whereas places like the hairpin or the, the the final chicane, you're doing a lot of your braking in a straight line, and you're carrying a lot of speed. Be interested to know how much these guys are adjusting bias over the course of a lap for those specific styles and different techniques of braking.
Well, it's certainly uh, something we could potentially ask our race winner after the race, but uh, we'll see as they go through. Turn number five into six on the brakes. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, historic track. You can pretty much point at any point of this track and say about something that's happened here in the history of motorsport. And uh, well, as they head on down to eight and nine, here comes a replay then. So this is lap one. This is Job and Fluke into that first chicane. Fluke is wide and oh, Dane Warren just gets into the back of Fluke there. Yeah, I don't think he anticipated Fluke maybe trying to check up and get in. Not only the difference in speed, but come back over the right as far. I thought maybe he would just try and hold the left and then be slower off of the corner, but that's that's ultimately 100% on him at that point in time. So definitely not what Dane Warren needs. Definitely something that the stewards will also look into, but for now it's it's onward for him. Alejandro Sanchez, by the way, in a great position. Yeah. Uh, and we mentioned that's not been having a good season, so sitting in fourth place, but Fluke has lost out dear because not only was he involved in that incident and had to wait for everyone to go by, but when he was trying to work back through the field, we saw that he was involved in one of the incidents at the hair pit, so can't get any luck today. Yeah, I've said this all season about Jamie. If he didn't have bad luck, he'd have no luck at all. And that's exactly what he's been experiencing once again out there. There's your front three still together. So Zach Campbell, after having it not being not being on the absolute pace on the first couple of laps has settled in in that third place in the slipstream of the cars in front and is doing a good job and right now there Sanchez behind he is well he's not quite gaining at the moment but Sanchez and Warren have been battling a little bit uh, on that previous lap so we'll see how Sanchez can do whether he can catch up to this leading trio as they head on down underneath the bridge tricky breaking point you've got a bump that's underneath that bridge and you have to abuse those curbs there you see that with these drivers over straddling those curbs i think some circuit designers wouldn't be happy about that but uh, the drivers they've got to take as much advantage as possible around here if there's a designer in the world who's ever created something that actually functioned the way that was intended without being exploited call me because i don't think that <laughs> happens ever so yeah absolutely people are going to try and find advantages where they can and the curbs are the advantage here in montreal uh, worth pointing out, Thomas Tetzela, best finish in a feature race this year is eighth. That means he's battling back through a, a number of positions from where he was respectively qualified. He's currently sitting in seventh in a sprint, which means he's in great position for the feature. This could be his best weekend of the year, Connery. It could well be. Uh, well, we've got a report on Mikael Gars, who's getting pretty frustrated at the moment because uh, he did say over the radio that uh, Josh Thompson, who's in that spot behind him, has hit him in the uh, in the rear bumper twice so far this race, and uh, is quite displeased on the way uh, about the way Josh Thompson's racing this. Well, it's just Morse code, isn't it, Paul? The first one is pick your line. The second one is I'll pick it for you, and the third is get the heck out of the way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a touring car technique if I've ever uh, seen one there. But uh, yeah, Thompson, he's, he's an aggressive driver. He's not had the best of luck this season. We saw he had another nightmare at Road Atlanta last time out. And uh, he'll be hoping to try and get some points out of this one. That's front three. They're staying as they are. There's, there's nothing going to be happening there between those three yet. And if anything, I think Rogers is just managing his pace at the front. Or maybe it's Job managing his pace behind Rogers to not get too close early on and then push on and really attack in those final couple of laps. So we'll have to wait and see about that one. But Sanchez, great position for him so far in fourth place. Of course, best result so far this season is the second place. And that one was at uh, Imola, of course, uh, in the feature race there. So uh, Sanchez looking to try and get himself some good points and a good position to start that feature race in. Through the final curbs, they leap over that chicane. And they're all just staying in the tire tracks of your race leader right now, Joshua Rogers, the man from Australia, currently residing in Germany. But Sebastian Job, the last year's champion, hounding the inaugural champion of this series, and he's pushing on. Further back then, Thomas Tetzela, we, we mentioned him here, Matt. He's in seventh place, and he's got Mitchell De Young in eighth right behind him. I think De Young 
do you take the extra points for finishing seventh or do you sit there and try and hold on to eighth place and get pole position for the feature yeah front row in this track is is often good enough um as you saw certainly josh rogers was able to get him that far enough alongside heading into turn one to hold for turn two you could justify them maybe getting one more position he's got a bit of a gap behind but it's gonna have to be pretty concise so it's Either way, it's a decent result in that sense, Paul. I mean, it's not like you're you're desperate for those points, but if the opportunity is there, you'll go for it. Here's something that you don't uh, you don't see normally. You look at these two drivers. Look how little energy they're putting into driving these cars. They're reserving as much of their energy and their uh, their uh, the resources that they've. Uh, fed themselves to keep themselves going at a top level through this race. Look at it, when they reach a, reach a straight, they're just sitting there, relaxed, they're not expanding any wasted energy in that uh, in those cars. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anyone who watched the uh, the iRacing Day 2024 hour, we've seen VRS in their exceptional win and flag to flag at that point. Um, Mitchell DeYoung and Josh Rogers both looked so relaxed and they you know, Mitch, Mitch got in the car and drove a three-hour stint to start, and when he got out of it, he looked the exact same. So they're definitely very composed, that's it. And that takes a lot of mental strength as well, because yeah. one of the things with sim racing is there's not as much physical sensation, and therefore things like looking at depth of field and judging your speed is, is very much mental and all, all visual, so it can be exhausting. Sebastian Job has caught up a little bit at the front of your field. It's run the penultimate lap of the sprint race, and I think this is it now. He's starting to put the pressure on Josh Rogers. I don't think he'll do any desperate move here, but he does want to try and get ahead of Josh into the end of this race so he can get himself at least a couple of points gained out of this sprint race. But uh, Job right now putting the pressure on the uh, race leader, Josh Rogers, and Zach Campbell is coming along for the ride here, Matt. Zach, quite frankly, is in the best position here. He can just sit back and judge what's happening in front of him. Yeah, actually, reverse order for fastest lap last time by. Josh did 37-2. It was 37-0 for Sebastian, but it was 36-9 for Zach. So you're absolutely right. Everyone's putting the pressure on trying to get in position for the last lap in the end of this race to make a move if it's there. And Sebastian, he wants to get to the front. He's got to go now. It's the first time we've seen the toe tried to be broken by Josh as he fans to the right and left down the straightaway. But Sebastian's close enough that maybe in the last lap he can go for it. Well, oh, he hit that car wrong. Did he touch the wall? Well, if he didn't, it was inches in it. But here's Zach Campbell now trying to take advantage of that mistake from Sebastian Job into the uh, opening corners. My goodness, that would have been uh, a, a big intake of breath there for Sebastian. But uh, Campbell not able to take advantage of that. But that just goes to show the fine lines that you have here of uh, between disaster and joy and right now sebastian will be just happy to finish in that second place if he can he'll keep himself composed he'll know what he's done there and between the two races he'll probably review what happened there on the replay to so be able to uh, assess and reset for the future race but uh, yeah job heart stopping moment for him almost into the wall of champions but through towards the end of the lap you can see campbell we're on board with him right now putting the pressure on sebastian sebastian moving over to the left he's trying to break any draft at all possible to the american it's Australia, it's Great Britain, and it's the United States on the podium so far. How will things pan out? This is Zach Campbell's opportunity. Job is 1.3 seconds back, so he won't be getting that much of a slipstream from your race leader in towards the chicane. They're not going to make any moves. So it's this man, Joshua Rogers. He made the move on the opening two laps of the race flies over the chicane and he will take victory then here in the sprint race of this sixth round of the Porsche Tagoya Esports Super Cup Job in second ahead of Zach Campbell your pole sitter, look at this though no, Jeff Giassi involved in a battle with Diogo Pinto and uh, Thibaut Casabon behind him with Pekka Toymanen coming up to try and make some moves, Daniel Lafuente and Mikel Gard ending up in 18th and 19th, Josh Thompson in 20th place to get the last point paying position in the sprint race but uh, Morena Sarika that car battered and bruised Matt that's not going back on the forecourt that needs some repairs 
Yeah, I would say that uh, definitely is going to have to get the uh, repairs. Thankfully, and I've asked iRacing if they would do this for me in real life, if they press and hold rescape, uh, escape, you get another car. I, I don't know why they can't just make that happen for me with my car. But uh, nonetheless, definitely some damage there. Lots of drama further back early stages of the race that will certainly have some people, the drivers, chatting afterwards about displeasure. But Josh Rogers gets it. Sebastian really wanted a good run out of the final chicane to have a chance on the final lap and it almost cost him dearly it manages just to avoid the wall and then somehow holds on to second place yeah absolutely seeing the rest of the results there on screen and uh well i shouldn't give on be disappointed with 23rd there martin krunker down in 25th jamie fluke he will be absolutely gutted by that 28th place finish. And two drivers did not finish, Johan Haas and Alexander Walters down at the back of your 36 car field here today. And uh, we'll hopefully in just a second, once we uh, we get told that we can do, we can hopefully speak to your race winner from that one. Matt, take it away with Josh. Absolutely. Uh, Josh and I are just becoming best friends the amount of time we chat together with all these wins. Uh, another one for you, pretty much, had it done early in the race, good start, and then you were pretty eager to make that, that lap early, or that position early. Was that due to Sebastian being behind or just wanted to get out in front in Montreal because of the nature of the circuit? Um, no, I mean, for me, I always felt, at least around this circuit, that I was uh, a little bit more comfortable out front, just from the standpoint of kind of lining your car up on the curbs and such. Um, and, you know, also at the same time, uh, you know, Zach made that mistake. Uh, I felt like it was a great time to try and capitalize on that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, he left us uh, just enough to, on the uh, on the right-hand side to, to get through. But, um, but no, from then on, it was just a matter of trying to, to kind of stay as consistent as I could. Um, you know, I wasn't pushing 100%. I don't think anyone was uh the front there it was just a matter of trying to kind of get through the chicanes as best as you can as clean as you can um and make as few mistakes usually that's the way it goes around here um, so i think in the, in the feature a lot of us coming from uh, a little bit further back you'll probably see us pushing a bit harder but um yeah we'll see sigh, sigh of relief when uh sebastian loses it a little bit going on to the final lap Definitely a little bit, yeah. I mean, I knew it was going to be close. I think he was probably just sitting there, to be honest, throughout most of the race, just keeping the gap where it needed to be, taking care of the tires. Um, I noticed he was kind of getting closer and closer, and it's definitely harder to... Um, you know, to run close between or behind other cars through the chicane. So I figured, uh, you know, if I try and get him as close as I can through the chicane, maybe a tiny little mistake might come up because, you know, he had wasn't necessarily used to that throughout the race um Absolutely. whether that's what it was or not but uh but no it was uh yeah awesome to get another win in the bank and uh, we'll see what we can do from pa hopefully we can stay out of trouble in the first few corners yeah congrats on another win i do, we do owe you an apology we did a feature about all the pole positions you've had you haven't gotten one since so uh that's our fault sorry about that but uh, best of luck in the feature race josh be a challenge but it should be fun coming through yeah fingers crossed thanks guys yeah, Paul, well, I'll just, I'll take the blame, okay? I had nothing to do with that feature, but I'll, I'll just fall on the sword for all of us and we can let, let it die there. Yeah, if anything, it was me on the uh, the countdown show. But uh, yeah, well, that was uh, that was the sprint race, of course. Coming up next, though, is the feature race here in the Porsche Takai Esport Super Cup from Montreal. Make sure you stick around right after this.
you guys. How about some gas for the car? And, uh, I'm gonna get some coffee. Well, after an exciting sprint race here in the Porsche Takoa Esports Super Cup by iRacing, we're now getting ourselves prepared for the feature race here today, just about four and a half minutes away from the action. But, uh, I, I mean, Matt, we look at that first race, there was quite a few incidents further down the field. We weren't sort of going to the ins and outs of who did what or when or why. Sure. But it shows how how tight this field is that as we mentioned in the in the countdown show, one little incident in front of you and you've got nowhere to go because this pack is so tight. Uh, absolutely. And it's not like those those incidents in the hairpin are, are suddenly, you know, exclusive to eye racing. We see this a lot in the real life series here as well. I mean, uh, you go back to 2019, sure, Roman DeAngelis walked away for anyone who follows the, the North American Porsche Cup, but there was a lot of contact around the circuit for similar yeah. in things, you know, different lines, different philosophies into places like the hairpin, turn one, some people hold it tight and open la open turn two, some people carry as much speed through, and they just kind of trip over each other a bit. So yeah, definitely the case, but uh, man, oh man, Josh Rogers, three in a row, and, and what what is that now, seven wins so far this season, Connery? That's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, an incredible performance, and he, he continues to build off of it, you know, grabbing the sprint race win here today, you know, potentially looking to work his way back through and at least get another podium, maybe another second place, because that seems to be the trend for uh, Joshua Rodgers. If he's not first, he's second, and that's all you really need to uh, to win a championship when push comes to shove. Uh, I got to say, though, it's going to be tougher for him coming into this main race than it would be at some other tracks, because I've heard uh, some chatter up and down the field that's the... Well, the common seems to be overtaking is basically impossible. So it's going to be a big, big struggle, especially if, if cars are equal on pace to be able to get past. Of course, we've we've had that story at so many other tracks this season, but it seems to be particularly bad here at Montreal. Well, Connery, you find yourself down at the hairpin then. You must have been uh, ducking <laughs> and diving for cover with all that that was going on. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the very few overtaking spots, isn't it? So uh, I think I've probably got the best seat in the house to see people at least attempt to get themselves by with the almighty sends down the inside. But yeah, this is basically the one of the only spots that you'll see. Another spot, of course, like down into turn one, if you get the good slipstream and a run out of the chicane, but that's that's the those are the only two possibilities that we've really seen. I actually used to sit in the top corner of the grandstand that's over your uh, left shoulder right now, so it is one of the best spots. I noticed Paul's actually in front of the casino, so I know where yeah. he's heading after the race, right? Just straight inside. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm not a betting man, as we all know from my predictions in this series. I, I sit on the fence, but, uh, you yeah, know, I, I may dabble one or two things. One thing that isn't a dabble, though, is getting yourself started on iRacing. Uh, get yourself signed up for your iRacing career. Every day is a race day here on iRacing. And if you've been enjoying what you've been seeing so far and thinking, hey, you know, I'd, I'd like to try that. iRacing.com for details. There's... Uh, deals for new members and also for, for existing members as well so 50% off new memberships right now so make sure you head on over at iRacing.com for further details for that but uh, well you know let's have a look at this venue once again here today and uh, Matt We've been, it, it's, a, it's a unique venue in the world of motorsport, a man-made island. Okay, there is one or two other tracks that are built on man-made islands, but this, it's a tremendous challenge for these drivers out there. Yeah, and it's so incredible to see an aerial view because it's just all water around it. In fact, the only thing that's really out there in the summer, you get a lot of cyclists and runners around the facility because it's not used as a racetrack. And about 7 million groundhogs that live on these islands. <laughs> uh, like, I'm not kidding. You park your car and you get out and you feel like you're going to be attacked by how many you see. Um, so there's a ton of them, mostly on the, the neighboring island of uh, Il Notre Dame. But yeah, there's there's a, there's, a, there's a ton of them out there. I think we've seen them make appearances during race weekends as well. But what a cool circuit. And it just, it flows so well in the space that it has. It doesn't have any elevation, as you say, but very technical, very speedy, very fast circuit. But uh, the, the first sector is very twisty. And very quickly, Connery, what are you expecting from this feature racer? 
I think we're kind of expecting more of the same, you know, couple of bits, couple of pieces of problems out there, especially on the start where drivers now seemingly like that they're trying to get back into position or if they're out of position trying to improve. So it's going to be a lot of risks taken and, uh, well, fingers crossed every everyone gets through it okay. Well, Connery, thank you for joining us here. We'll be hearing from you throughout the uh, the race here. But these drivers are getting themselves prepared for the start of this main race on round number six of the Porsche Takoya Esports Super Cup. Of course, the top eight finishers reversed on the grid. So that means that Mitchell de Young is on pole position with Thomas Tetzler. What a place to start for him in row one with Kevin Ellis Jr., Dan Warren, Alejandro Sanchez, and Zach Campbell looking for a good result again in race number two. And then the rest of your grid will be going through your screen. Sebastian Job, Joshua Rogers continuing their battle out there on track. Uh, looking further down, Greg Carroll on run number six. We've got Tadioga Pinto, who will be slightly disappointed with his run in the sprint race. And then the rest of your grid will be firing through that because we haven't got a lot of time to be able to uh, show you the whole grid here. So uh, David Williams, row 11. He's, uh, he's not going to be happy with that. And uh, Igor Kalsfenel is a row 15 for him. Charlie Collins, look out for him. Look out for Johan Haas as well, trying to make their way through the field. But we're getting set for the start of the feature race here. The revs are rising. And the green flag is out. We're underway for 20 laps of action here around Circus Gilles Villeneuve, down towards the first chicane. We'll see whether everyone can make it through. No, they can't. There's a car off in the background. That was Pekka Toymanen, who was around. And Tommy Erskard finds himself off track as well. Rest of them working their way through. Oh, big, no. big, big crash down at the back there. My goodness, that Ricardo Castroledo taking a bit of a ride there. Alexander Walters, Thibaut Casabon, Anchan Gouvan uh, will find themselves down there, down towards that second chicane. Alejandro Sanchez is wide. Job had no way to go except into the side of Dane Warren there. That is huge for last year's champion. He doesn't want to get involved in, uh, in other people's accidents. And, uh, well, there was contact between the Brit and the Australian. As they go through that chicane there towards the hairpin for the first time, look at the gap that the front three have got away already. They are running away at the front. Sanchez and Campbell battling away as well as they head into the hairpin. Two by two. It's like Noah's Ark down there at the hairpin as they come out that corner and head on down towards the chicane, the final chicane on the first lap here. But uh, huge drama involving last year's champion there, Matt. Absolutely, and a bit of karma maybe for Dane Warren. Remember, he was the one to get into Jamie Fluke in the opening race lap of the first race. So this time he's into the wall. De massive damage. I wasn't sure if it was Charlie Collins at the back that was caught up in that, but it was Cinder Setsos that was one of the cars to go over. Alexander Thieb as well. Dane Warren way down near the back now, despite starting near the front. So big drama all the way through. And I thought going three wide into the hairpin as well. You had Maximilian Benecke trying to make a move. Rogers in that and both Red Bull cars all trying to find the same position. So this is a massively dramatic start to our final race. Thomas Tetzel is still in a good position right now, sitting in P3. But Kevin Ellis Jr. has made the most places. Ooh. And a kiss of the wall. We said turn four. That's the other spot. It's very common, but you can get away with it. It's just the rear tire that taps that time. Yeah, he, he did just kiss that wall, did Zach Campbell. Of course, he pulled Sitter from the opening race, Zach. And he's uh, just finding his feet once again. You really saw Zach Campbell coming to his own in the second half of that feature race. So maybe with their race setups, they're more set up for the, uh, the long feature race here so we'll have to see how campbell handles those cars there's the front three so that's de young it's ellis jr and it's tetala and then behind them you see that queue of traffic behind zach campbell into that uh, sanchez is deep sanchez is deep and worse than that behind beneke got tagged i think that's josh rogers looking into the back of him so drama for the championship leader beneke gets taken around in the hairpin we saw him involved in the first first race in that position as well but this is allowed Graham Carroll now up to fifth, who started well down the order outside of the top eight, and Sanchez recovers to sixth, but that's a big miss for him, and Job's going to be all over him. We don't get a look at okay, we do now. Job didn't quite get enough of a run. I thought he might be side by side into the final chicane. Well, they're heading down into that uh, first couple of corners. 
And yeah, Job finding himself or Sanchez, um, I've just seen on our timing screen is behind Carroll now. Job is there in seventh, trying to work through as well. But this front three at the moment sliding their way through. That chicane again getting really close to the wall there with Zach Campbell. The front three, they're going to just stay as they are now. They're just going to take their time here. I think Beneke has parked it. I, we'll get to that in a second because we're going to look at a replay at the start first. So likely Dane Warren's incident. But then you've got to consider Rogers is down a bit. Paul, oh, this is this is huge. There's some big names involved in these incidents. Good start off the line. You said it. Everyone looked clean heading into turn one. And then it was Pekka Toyman in as soon as we hit the braking zone. Now, did he get assistance in that? Oh, he did. Unfortunately, did. He got tapped. Uh, just ever so slightly by Daniel Lefuente, and that put him off in turn one. There was Tommy Ostgaard going off, and of course, everyone's piling around in one big group. Oh, oh, oh they'll open over. There goes Ricardo Castroledo as they uh, find themselves back on. As uh, we come back now, oh, here's another replay, and this is Benneker. This is the incident that happened between him, and uh, that was, I believe, Josh Rogers who uh, made the contact there. Yeah, Josh is down in 12th place as a result of that. He was ninth, so he lost three spots. Benica comes out worse off for it because I don't even see him in the running list. I think he's parked it. He's down a lap. Yeah, down two laps now. So he's, he's currently showing red, which indicates not running. But this is exactly the chance that Sebastian Job needs. This is it, Josh Rogers has been first or second in every race bar one where he made a mistake of his own accord and the opening round of the season. So. You don't get too many opportunities like this. Job currently sits seventh. His teammate Graham Carroll's just in front in fifth. Sanchez is no weakness in between them. That'll be a challenge in itself, but he needs to get points. Sebastian needs to get through this now. Yeah, this is the time to get some, uh, get yourself some good championship points and try and start clawing away at that championship lead. De Jong will be hoping to stay out there at the front because he is in prime position. He was second coming into this week's standings and he'll be hoping to, uh, to come out of this one a little bit closer to Josh Rogers down into turn eight and nine underneath the bridge. There's Job behind Sanchez, being patient. Plenty of time left in this race. We're only on lap four of 20 here, so there's no need to panic, no need to rush things. And you can see there's a little bit of front left damage as well from that contact that Job made with Dame Warren. So he's feeling the effects of that and you'll be feeling the effects of it down the straights. Looking further back in the background of that shot then, there was side by side between La Fuente and Rogers. Rogers, you can see in the background. Oh, here comes Sanchez looking as well. Trying to make some moves now. Down into the chicane, La Fuente in the background was making defensive moves into the chicane and stayed ahead of Rogers as they go across the line here. Start lap five here is De Young, Ellis Jr, Tetela. Here's Rogers to the inside of turn one, but that gives him the outside for turn two. And if he's not careful, people can make some moves down the inside. He's fine. He's staying there in second, 12th place, but he wants to get a move on here, Matt. Yeah, he desperately does. Uh, just to, to, to touch on what you said too, it's easy to focus on Sebastian Joel being last year's champion and the rivalry that's kind of developed between the two, but you nailed it. I mean, Charlie Collins has fallen down. That's another of the top three runners right now in the championship of Mitchell D. Young and Kevin Ellis Jr. This is a big day for them as well, sitting currently one, two in this race, but Josh isn't done. He's a fighter. He's going to try and work his way back through this. And if you look in front of him, that's a big train of cars, which means it's all doable. They're all there for the taking. If he can, if he can be efficient about this. Yeah, efficiency is the key. You've also not got to get yourself involved in any contact as well, because we've seen how that can affect people out there. Uh, this, this is interesting. And just a point, I, I know we're focusing on Josh right now, but we just saw the Red Bulls almost side by side. Graham's been having trouble getting off the hairpin. It'll be interesting to see if he's held up enough because Sebastian got an overlap with Sanchez as a result of that, and I think he's going to pull it through. There you go, bottom of the screen. I think this is where the Red Bulls are going to start to try and work together. Graham's going to move over to the right, allow Sebastian up, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's a little bit of a lift. Oh, it's just, it's, it's so hard to do that. 
that and be fair game about it and also not cause a bottleneck, but it does, it, it worked perfectly. He gets him offline, slows him down early, Job goes through, and now watch, Graham's gonna tow his teammate forward. Yeah, he certainly is, and well, Sanchez is about to lose enough position to Jeremy Bootslip as well, and Diogo Pinto. So Pinto and Bootslip trying to take advantage of the situation, and uh, well, Sanchez getting absolutely freight trained back here, losing two positions, about to lose a third one into the chicane, although Sanchez does manage to just stay side by side with Bootslip able to carry on as this front three is getting a little bit close again so those three i still think that they're just going to stay as they are for the time being and just look after the tires conserve the tires conserve the brakes and uh, think about battling towards the end because if these three start battling now zach campbell it's about three and a half seconds behind, but he can start coming up and, well, we just saw Carol and Job, they're working together to try and move forward as well. Yeah, this is, this is quite a train. So one position already, Sanchez back that far as a result. I mean, that's crazy. This guy was sitting sixth a lap ago when you lose the momentum and get pushed out of the train and just backwards the whole entire time, just can't get his footing. It's so frustrating. It's, you know, we see court racing all the time where momentum is such a key, but Josh Rogers now on the back of him and Sanchez gonna be battling for position the whole way down the straight. Graham Carroll's trying to it's still help Sebastian break away from Diago Pinto, who's seven. What a great position for him to find himself in at this point. Yeah, well, I mean, he, he, was, he would have been disappointed with race one after falling down a little bit, but uh, he uh, he's found himself in that seventh place in a good position. We've seen how aggressive Diogo can be as well out there. So uh, Graham Carroll, we, you mentioned it, in the opening round of the championship, he, he didn't know what to expect from Diogo in that opening round and just gave him space. But uh, interested to see now that Sanchez and also Rogers are squabbling away and they're losing a little bit of time to Thompson and Bootslip ahead. Thompson finds himself in ninth place after starts his race in 20th. Well, and not only that, I mean, it's the guys like Graham and Diogo who were, I think, in, in the mid-teens in qualifying, and I think 12th, 13th, 14th, somewhere in that realm for each of them at the end of the sprint race. The front guys are battling so hard today that they've given so much opportunity to some of these guys that they find normally mid-pack, and suddenly great point scoring positions for all of them. It goes back to the mentality you said at Montreal, you know, stay out of the walls, keep it consistent, try and be, be smart about it. And those guys are paying the, you're getting the reward for that. So here we are then, you've got that battle for the lead up on top. It's De Young, it's Ellis Jr. and it's Thomas Tetela. In fact, let's go full screen on these three because they are in a trio. They're on the run out there at the front and they're just getting themselves prepared for the second half of the race when they may start battling away. But uh, why don't we give you a taste of Montreal and let's go a lap on board with Thomas Tetela with this Vodafone on board and have a listen to the sights and sounds of Montreal.
there you go. There's a lap on board with the man in third place, Thomas Tetzela. They found themselves about three and a half, four seconds ahead of fourth place. Zach Camel does this uh, leading trio here out there on track. They've got the track to themselves in front of them as well. 29 cars running at the moment in this race. One driver I just noticed that had dropped down the order on the timing screen is Jeremy Bootsloops. He's down yes. to 28, so he's had an incident somewhere out there. I would imagine that it would be down at the hairpin, given that when I saw him drop down the order. But yeah, it is De Young, Ellis Jr., Tetela, Zach Campbell, Graham Carroll, Sebastian Job, and Diogo Pinto. And then the rest of the field find themselves in one big queue from eight all the way down to 26 here, Matt. Yeah, great race from Thomas Tetela. Great weekend overall for him. His pace is excellent. He's done the fastest lap of the race. It's 37-1, which is a little bit slower than what we saw in the first race. And since then, the times have actually dropped. They're about a half second off that. We've just passed the halfway point. Air temperature, I'm going to say, is a little bit more true to Montreal in June when they would run this race because I can tell you outside my window, and I'm, I'm not far from Montreal. I'm not far in Canadian terms, I'm quite far overall, but it's it's damn cold out there. So warm <laughs> track nonetheless, as uh, as yeah, this is everyone kind of just sort of sit, settling in and trying to buy our time. We're going to look back. This is Jeremy Boots loop and exactly what happened. You were dead right. It was down at the hairpin. Oh, just a wee tap as they checked up. And again, that's the different choice of line entry speed versus exit speed. He, he slows, little slows the car down a little bit more and tries to go late and straight and just gets caught out because of it. Yeah, and that was Josh Thompson who made that contact there. So uh, there he is. There's his uh, view of him driving along. And uh, how did he end up with two hats? I only got one hat, but there you go. Um, as, we, <laughs> as we go through the, uh, the turn two, and he sat right behind Josh Rogers at the moment. He's putting pressure on Rogers. He's got uh, Daniel LaFuente. Now, he, Daniel is a, is a compatriot in the same team as Josh, so uh, they are competing against each other, but they'll also be not wanting to get involved in any contact between the two of them either, because they both need the points out there today to try and progress forward in the championship here. Yeah, absolutely. And it's worth noting as well at the halfway point, you guys touched on it on our countdown to Green Show that inside the top 20, you requalify outside of that. You've got to I should say you automatically requalify, excuse me, if outside the top 20, you need the hard way, qualify yourself manually for the next season, so to speak. So guys like Diogo Pinto, who's sitting 20th, great day for him to score some points and make gains. Oldsman's not present today, so that's that's an issue because he's 19th. So it's going to become very, uh, or 18th, excuse me, in the championship. It's going to become very tight between these guys. So it's worth keeping an eye on that part of the championship as well. Worth keeping an eye on Josh Rogers right now out of the hairpin, as it looks like this time he's got to run on Sanchez. Yeah, he certainly has got the better run out of the hairpin. They're going almost three wide in front of them as well with the two uh, Red Bull drivers. Sebastian Jobs moved ahead of Graham Carroll. And here, Rogers trying to get himself ahead of Sanchez. We know how good Sanchez is behind the wheel of this Porsche 911 GT3 Cup car. Rogers getting squeezed to the grass there by Sanchez. Very aggressive. Meanwhile, your leaders there, but carrying on as they are into the hairpin sanchez exit exit right there and rogers goes through yeah a bit of drama Rog, jo joshy didn't like that at all he flashed the lights immediately as they got back onto the tarmac but that's one more position for josh to make up uh, and then behind sanchez loses out one more so he's gone from the very front end of this field all the way down the order and it's exactly what we talked about with him it's just not been a good season and today i have to say it's not been really bad luck he's just put himself in some Pretty unfortunate positions, battling maybe a little bit, mm, bit of a bit too touchy for, for the racing standards out there, and it's cost him quite a bit. And the driver who was protecting Josh Thompson, Daniel Fuente, has gone back to the pits. That's why oh, he's no. up there at the top of your timing tower at the moment. I was just about yeah. to touch on him. I mean, 11th place is 20 points, and he sits 26. That's huge for requalifying next year. Absolutely. So uh, don't panic. Lafuente is not in the lead of this race. It is still Mitchell De Young at the head of the, uh, the standings here. The Lafuente, you'll see him drop down the order as the leaders go past the pit lane. But yeah, they see Graham Carroll. He gave the well, he didn't give the position up. He made Sebastian fight for it as they went down into the chicane. 
But Sebastian now at the head of that three-car train of Job, Carroll and Pinto behind. And now Carroll's got to be concerned about Diogo Pinto behind because Pinto wants to get himself some good points. He's, he was in 20th heading into this round of the championship. He wants to get some serious points here. And Rogers in eighth place as well is not far behind this. He's going to be closing. I mean, what an impressive driver. Back to 12th in some definitely tough precarious circumstances car looked like it might have been damaged and still he's closing down this 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 pack and that's points for him every point matters i mean yes he's got a massive lead but not giving any to the others de Jong still leads this race half tenth over kevin ellis jr but yeah diego pinto is is definitely on the charge you can tell just the setup of the car the aggression of how much he's closing under braking he's not lifting or relaxing and just allowing that gap to stay the same he's on the attack you can see it in the energy yeah, so you're not missing a thing up at the front there still as they are. They, they, they've not changed. They're not making any moves or anything like that. Look at Pinto really straddling that curb then. He is pushing the boundaries of track limits to the very limit here today. So he is definitely trying his best to get ahead. And look who's just loitering around behind them. Josh Rogers, he's catching up there. Joshua Rogers, the Australian, trying to get with these cars because he wants to move ahead of them and try and get himself as many points as possible. He was down to 14th at one point in this race with Rogers. Finds himself in eighth now, so a bit of a recovery. Back to where he started here in this race, Matt. Absolutely. We've got uh, Max Benecke that's going to join us, obviously, unfortunately. Oh, excuse me. I think he's going to be joining us, I should say. I thought I had the call. He was ready to speak, but we'll chat with him, obviously, out of this race. We saw that drama down at the hairpin. It left him on the side and, and, then, and then unfortunately had to retire. I think he has joined us now. So Max, Montreal on the calendar this year in Porsche. It was always going to be a race where someone was going to find a wall or pay some circumstances. You never want to be that person, but it's a tough track to race at. Yeah, for sure it is. Um, was not the best race so far as of today. Um, I mean, first race was alrighty, um, but still got caught up in a couple of incidents. Um, but then just tried to maintain my position in the second race, but unfortunately got hit from behind. But, you know, that's how it goes. Um, I had the same with the guy ahead of me the first race, so those pileups just happen and you gotta be careful. Um, I think I got tapped like four or five times in this race just because it's like getting so narrow and people close up. So it's just difficult, but yeah, uh, on to the next one. I think you've probably, if we, if we looked at it, you've made the most positions on track this season. You find yourself in seventh in the championship with a handful of top fives, one podium to your name so far, but what do you need to address to take that next step? Is it, is it qualifying itself or is it just staying out of these sort of battles that are costing you every now and then? Yeah, it's mainly qualifying. It's all about qualifying. I mean, the races are 15 and 30 minutes, so you've got to be in the top positions uh, already at the beginning. Um, also, to get the good reverse spot um, for the second race. And that's just where I don't get. I think my best qualifying this year was P10 or P11. So that's just unacceptable. I, I don't exactly know what we're doing wrong, but there's something that, that we're missing. Um, I mean, I only got out qualified by uh, my teammate once um, and um, the rest of the races I was ahead. So it, it's like, you know, nobody from us can, can improve. Um, so it's, it's really difficult. It's frustrating, obviously, um, but we're trying our best to, to figure it out at one point. Um, but obviously, yeah, it's all about qualifying. Yeah, well, hopefully that can improve. Uh, listen, you got double duty this weekend as well, so we won't keep you for too long. Uh, good luck in Pathers, that's going on as well. And, uh, and obviously, um, best of luck in the rest of the season. Thanks very much, and enjoy the rest of the race. Yeah, obviously, uh, Red Lion involved in the 12 Hours of Bathurst put on by iRacing. That is a number of people are doing double duty in this weekend. Obviously, it's a stint endurance race, so these guys obviously not driving this stint right now, Paul. Yeah, absolutely, as they, uh, they go along. But here's what's happened then a little bit earlier, and this is going to be on board Joshua Rogers. And look at that squeeze then from Sanchez. You'll see Sanchez goes in deep into one and that compromises then. The back end's just sliding out. He can't get that car stopped. And Rogers says, thank you very much. I'll take that inside line in that position. And look at him now. Rogers, he's ahead of Pinto. Already made the move on Pinto. And now he's got Graham Carroll setting his sights. That's incredible. That's incredible pace because, I, I mean, I said it. it. It was a line of cars in front. If he could get them one at a time and be efficient, it was there for the taking, but did I think it was possible considering the pace of some of these drivers? And when he finally did get 
uh, ahead of Sanchez as we saw. There was a gap he had to close down on. He did that by doing a 36.9 fastest lap of the race and some half second faster than everyone over the last lap. Uh, that is ridiculous pace that he's been able to keep in that car. Well, one thing that I will mention here is that was something that we've not talked about at all. It is looking after those rear tires jumps from wide. It's, it's, it's an easy mistake to make there into turn two. And Job, in one instance, has lost two positions, although he's fighting this one with Rogers. It's a, almost a losing battle into four. Oh, don't make contact. They do make contact between the two of them. Here comes Pinto over the grass. He's trying to make some moves now. He's into the wall. Jump ahead once oh. again. Rogers, can they keep it side by side? Yes, they can. And here comes Pinto again. All of a sudden, this has come alive between these three drivers. All from one mistake here, Matt. Yeah, and guess who's back? Sanchez is closing on this. These guys have lost food to group camp. Careful, what a battle between them. All three of them finding ways to stay in this fight, despite all three of them nearly being dead in the wall. This is incredible. And Sebastian still isn't done because he's going to have a run down to the hairpin. Josh naturally will defend the inside. Diego's going to be sitting wondering which line to take. Who do I follow? Is Sebastian? Ooh, he wanted to turn in, but Josh was not ready to do so. And I think that's going to cost him because he desperately wanted to try to get the best possible line for a run down the straight. Diogo, though, he's got the best of the three because he was the only one that got to take a natural entry into the corner. But Job gets to run out of the corner by taking that wide line. He wasn't happy with Job. Oh, my goodness, they're going three wide into that final chicane. Will they sort themselves out? There's a little bit of bump in a barge in. And amazingly, Job goes from the back of the queue to the front of the queue in one move. And now Sanchez is making some moves on Diogo Pinto behind. So all of a sudden, your two champions from 2019 in 2020 they start battling and everyone else is is trying to feed off the scraps here three wide into the last chicane i thought it was going to be the wall of two champions really fast <laughs> i'll give you that one matt as they uh, head on through into turns three and four then they've sorted themselves out it's that battle behind that i want to uh, to see there because sanchez has now found himself ahead of pinto there as uh, you can see on the timing scoring bug on the left hand side there so in eighth place for sanchez pinto down to ninth thompson now thompson pinto the yes they are rivals out there the portuguese man and the man from the isle of man but they are also compatriots out of that williams esports outfit so they won't want to get involved in any instance between the two of them because they've got michael guard right behind who's a bit feisty speaking of feisty here comes rogers to the outside because job takes that defensive line into the hairpin now job's clever there he parked that car on the apex he didn't let rogers get the run oh rogers oh. going up on the grass again what on earth that's the second time this race he's gone to the grass we're going to the replay of what happened earlier on in three and four was there contact i think there just was rogers grazed the wall but back to life pictures here rogers desperate to make it ahead of job here sebastian did so well just to make that corner and we've seen what happens when people run there it's so hard to rejoin and not have contact so they both get away with it josh is not done look at how much karubi is taking how attack uh, how much on the attack he is i mean we saw him out of the hairpin he's in the draft he was fully committed and even though he had no overlap nearly put himself into the wall on the grass trying to get a run on sebastian who just has to position his car and cleverly to keep him behind down the front straight as well we'll look back to the front there's four laps to go it's almost unfortunate for poor thomas tetela who's having the race of his career right now in pesk but he's not getting any camera time the other two they've gotten their fair share this season but it's all the battling behind that's keeping us busy yeah absolutely the front three have stayed as they are but it's this battle over sixth place and down that's really coming on this is really starting to show here onto the brakes underneath the bridge job cannot afford any more mistakes like he made through turn one into two and uh, rogers well ever the opportunist the australian trying to make some moves here into the hairpin job taking a little bit of a defensive line but 
as I say, he can park yeah. that car on the apex, get the drive out the corner. That's exactly what he did. Look at that queue of cars behind Sanchez as well. Just a, a whole queue of the rest of the field, it seems, out there as Job and Rogers side by side down to the chicane. And is Rogers going to make this one count around the outside? Job carries the speed through the chicane, not this time, almost into the wall of champions, the both of them. And behind Sanchez, still ahead of Pinto, Thompson, Gade. Brian Lockwood, really good position as well. Finding himself in 12th place, this is good from Brian as well. He's had a difficult season so far, but these drivers, they're all putting it on the line here today, Matt. Absolutely. Sanchez is coming back into this as well. I mean, we talked about the unfortunate aspect of him getting pushed down the order. Well, he's found his rhythm again. He's mentally reset and he's got a chance to get back into this battle as well. Bit of clear track in front. That was one of the things I wanted to touch on with Tetela's lap and Josh Rogers touched on it in the interview prior to the first race. Following is oh, a little bit wide for Sanchez there. Following is difficult around a track like this where curves are so important and it's so difficult to have a sight line and really get your reference points dialed on curbs that punish you so severely when you do get them wrong and the walls being so close. And Josh is still managing to attack so effectively on Sebastian right now. It's such a tricky thing to do, but this is a cue of cars behind that all could benefit if that battle continues at this point in time is a lot of people making moves right now. Mikael Gaeta involved in this, Josh Thompson, as we said, Thiago Pinto still in a great position in this race. It's anyone's game. Brian Lockwood, look, you say he's been Know, had some speed at times, but he's another one that is knocking on the door of this fight. Yeah, Lockwood, it's not been a good season for him. On the 19 points in the championship heading into this week, so he's finding himself in a good position to get some good points. Here comes the battle for the lead now. Ellis Jr. has decided that now is the time to pull the trigger, and look at Thomas Tetela. He's going to take advantage of that because he's got the inside line for this and then the next corner. And it's going to be a change for second place. Thomas Tetzler into three makes it ahead of Ellis Jr. I I've been in this exact situation around this circuit. It's exactly that. You want to go for a move, but it's so difficult to make the move stick. And we saw it with exactly that with Sanchez. As soon as you're forced out of line, the next guy's coming through. You can't close the door fast enough. And that was very smart from Thomas Tetzler. I realized that Kevin Ellis Jr. was going to be overlapped and not get the inside for two positioned his car appropriately got as deep under braking for one as he could and snuck in and took that line from him that's just great racecraft now if mitchell deal's clever he'll try and run away at the front if these two start fighting a bit more but i think ellis jr realizes with, with actually two to go sorry two laps to go in this race he realizes that you know he did defense hole well, speaking of defense Tetzler didn't show any into the hairpin and that's allowed Ellis Jr. through but this is allowing De Young to be able to just slightly gap these two behind him if they start squabbling even more then De Young's going to run away for the lead they can't afford to fight too hard Tetzler third place you see him into the chicane no he's thinking twice against that and it's probably the correct decision to make there through in towards the start the final lap here Matt and Thomas Tetzler has shown that he wants that second step of the podium yeah good play from Kevin Ellis Jr just parked it up on the apex once he got on the inside it's such a slow exit slow corner of the hairpin that you can do that and prevent the overlap and then it's really you're forcing the guy on the outside to compromise his exit as well so you can get away with it as opposed to uh, leaving the door open in, in most of the high-speed corners where you try something similar. So good read, good play, good good driving from both of them to leave space, and it's not done because already Tutsala's all over them. Meanwhile, we've got to go double box. How can we possibly cover everything that's going on right now? So much action. It's Josh Rogers still all over Sebastian Joe further down. At this point, Graham Carroll has checked out in front of them, but this is the battle for sixth on track. Job with a tremendous defensive display in sixth place to keep uh, to keep Joshua Rogers and he'll call him Sebastian Rogers then uh, behind him uh, up at the front though it is De Young, Ellis Jr. and Tetela. They're heading down towards the hairpin for the final time in this race. Ellis Jr. is flashing the lights. He's trying to get in the head of Mitchell De Young. It's all about the run out of the hairpin and getting the power down getting a good clean run de young is trying to break the slipstream here down the back straight ellis jr 
He's got to pick a side. If he can get a one side into the chicane, he's going to make the move. There's the Scotsman flashing his headlights, decides against it. All De Young has to do, make it through the final chicane, and he is going to take the win. Look at the joy on his face there. He realizes his job is done across the line to take victory in the victory race here in the Porsche Tag Heuer Esports Super Cup at Montreal. This one's not done either because Job and Rogers heading to the line. It's going to be job in six just ahead of Rogers. Sensational battling between your two previous champions out there on track. Absolutely fantastic. Rest of your field is going to run through. And for the second week in a row, only 26 drivers are going to finish the main race here, the feature race in this race. Good grief, <laughs> there's Ricardo Rica with a battered and bruised car, and he does not score any points, even though he made it to the end of the race. Let's take a look at those race results, because it's the American, the man from California, Mitchell DeYoung, who takes victory ahead of Kevin Ellis Jr., the Scotsman in second place. Thomas Tesla, fantastic result there from Thomas to finish in third place. Best result of the season. Zach Campbell, the American in fourth, ahead of Graham Carroll in fifth place. And then that battle between the 2020 and the 2019 champions in sixth and seventh place. Sanchez, Mikel Gard, and Salva Talens round out your top 10. Sarika then is in 11th place in the results here. Ahead of Fluke, Williams, Ramstein, Lockwood, Pinto, Thompson dropped down to 17th on that last lap, so something happened to him with Aichan Guvan, Tommy Oskar, Jeff Giasi in 20th. Charlie Collins then recovery to 21st. He'll be disappointed with this weekend. So too will Johan Hart as well. Alexander Walters and Martin Krunker in 23rd, 24th. And Jeremy Bootloop, the last of your point scorers with Ricardo Rico, the last of your finishers. Rest of your drivers did not finish that race. Well, let's take a breath here and head on into the Buzz post race show here, Matt, because well, Rogers and Job, these two just keep on giving out there, don't they? Oh, it's unbelievable. I, I mean, I feel I feel guilty because I, I sometimes we, we give them so much attention and there's so many other drivers doing such exceptional work. I mean, Thomas Tetzla is the driver of the day for me. What a what a performance from him. Uh, a great result held on at the front, was every bit as fast, made some great daring opportunity, uh, opportunistic moves. And uh, and and yet we still focus on Job and Rogers because they, they're just always on it. And you can't tell me that it doesn't matter. I mean, I know Joe is, is a little bit behind. Rogers has this cushy lead. When they're next to each other on track, you can be damn sure that's all that matters in that moment. They want to beat each other. That is a rivalry at this point. Well, if you can get that victory over your rival here and against the person that you lost the championship to last season, Rogers will want to get that position to try and get a notch there against Job, to try and get that mental edge to say, look, I can beat you anytime I want. But Job, that was crucial for him. Yes, I know it's not really gaining many points against Rogers in the championship, but it's crucial for him. But let's not forget the front three. Great driving from all three of them. And Matt, you've got Mitchell De Young, your race winner. Yeah, talking to him a lot lately. Another fantastic result this season as you continue to impress Mitch. I'll, I'll forgive Josh. He might be a little tired right now for doing uh, not doing a cartwheel behind you. He still owes us one, but that's a good result for you in Montreal. Absolutely. Um, you know, last uh, last time we were here was 2019, the very first season of uh, the Porsche Esports Super Cup. And, um, you know, Josh uh, got one away from me right at the end, the last couple of laps. Um, so, man, after, you know, last week being so close to a win and um, honestly really having a difficult time in practice to, to you know, come away with a, a win here, this is incredible. My first in the series and the feature, um, and it feels so good. Uh, I, I really need to give a big shout out to, like, all my teammates because I was struggling so hard in practice just to put it together. So big shout out to the guys for, you know, getting me up to speed, doing all the setup work. Um, obviously, we had a week to prepare for this one, which is a track where you really need kind of like two weeks, maybe three. Um, so, you know, everyone just grinded it out. Just huge shout out to them. Pretty impressive. This is your first feature win. I didn't even realize that because I'm kind of used to seeing you at the front now. But Josh said it was better to be at the front around this track for sight lines as opposed to other tracks where drafting and, and whatnot, tire saving has been more of the strategy. Would you agree with that? Were you more comfortable in the front than 
maybe blindedly going at some of those walls? Without a doubt, um, this track obviously is so difficult with the curbs, um, as you guys have seen. We uh, really launch the car off of them, which is very fun, um, but also it's very hard to hit right. Um, just having a, a clean track in front of you where you can just see exactly what's going on is so helpful here. Um, as you saw at the end, I nearly threw it away really in the last uh, you know, few times through the, the last chicane. Um, very difficult to get right. So um, uh, honestly, the fact that you know we we didn't have any catastrophic crashes in this uh, twenty lap feature was um, kind of like a miracle for me um, after practice. So uh, man, it feels so good. That's pretty impressive. I mean, it, it, the other thing too is I know he's your teammate, but this is a good point to all overall. And surely you've got to be thinking about the championship for yourself as well. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, we just have to kind of take it one race at a time. Um, I would say these remaining tracks are a little bit more racy. Um, some of these are still very driver based, um, but I would say now that we get into Spa, um, Le Mans, obviously Monza, um, you know, there's a lot of draft involved in uh, what we already have quite a bit of draft in. So um, hopefully I can channel some of my NASCAR experience into that and, um, you know, Bump kind drafting. Of, yeah, <laughs> potentially, um, but just kind of play the game right. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. All right. Well, hey, congratulations. I first feature win I'm, I'm impressed by that stat alone it seems like it it seems like so so natural for you but uh, great result thank you appreciate it uh yeah i i am very impressed by that paul that that statistic i mean he's been so consistent all year has has mitchell de young and that's another great hall of points he's certainly become someone with four races now left on the calendar we have to look at and very closely consider as as a front runner in this championship He's certainly been uh, putting the pressure on, that's for sure. He's uh, He'll be glad with the win here and getting some points back off of Josh Rogers. But uh, let's sell to your second place driver then, Matt. Yeah, another driver that we have to also consider as an absolute contender in this championship, Kevin Ellis Jr., proving that uh, you definitely come into this season focused. Uh, you were impressive last year, but this year's a whole other level again, I feel like. Your consistency at the front has been remarkable and, and no different here. Yeah, I didn't expect to get that result today, I've got to be honest. Um, I was really struggling a lot in practice, and this really hasn't been a track that's that's favoured me much in the past. So, um, you know, to, to rock up here today and, and do what we've done, I think, was really good. It was a great day for the team in general. Um, I think, you know, it's all well and good saying that I've got better, but a huge test when it has to go to the to the rest of the team as well. You know, those are the guys that, that push me forward every single week. And, and you know, to have Zach on pole and finish fourth in the feature was, was a great day. Um, great day for RLL. Um, so, yeah, just really grateful for uh, for the group that I'm I'm surrounded by at the minute. Um, everyone's working really well together, and every single week we think, you know, maybe this might not be the week that we rock up and we're good. And every single week we're we're still right where we need to be. So, um, yeah, it's just been a, a great season so far, and hopefully we can we can carry that for the last four rounds. Yeah, what's what track are you looking forward to the most out of the last four? I'd say it's got to probably be Norch Life. Um, I had, had a good run there last year. Um, had a promising start to uh, to the feature there and unfortunately cooked the tires off a bit and lost the lead and eventually dropped down to fourth. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting there. It's a great circuit, especially in this car. Um, so I've, I've had that one circled from uh, from the start of the year. All right. Well, that's uh, I like that. That's that's one of my own right there. Got to love the Norch Life. So best of luck. Hey, good result again today. This is shaping up to be a pretty good championship. Yeah, much appreciated, guys. There we go. I think if, it was, uh, if he didn't have uh, six million uh, desktop icons, his, his, his camera might be a little quicker there, Paul. But uh, <laughs> the man of the day for me, Thomas Tetela, that is a heck of a result for you. I mean, that's a huge points tally. And you had pace. You, you very easily could have found yourself on the front if, if it had gone a little differently. What, what was different for you coming into Montreal that made the difference? Um, so I actually don't really like this track. <laughs> I didn't have that much practice. Uh, but I think we finally managed to get the qualifying warm-up thing correctly. Uh, I've had a really good race pace the whole season, but this was the first time that I could actually get close in qualifying. I even, even didn't really like get a good lap in qualifying, but it was still enough for P11, I think. Yeah, you... uh, yeah. It's it's much easier to get close to the top uh, when you start that much higher. I think, yeah, you've been quite close a number of times in sprint races, but not enough to get in that top eight for the reverse grid. I mean, is that something you need to focus on? Because it doesn't seem like you're caught in drama too often. You seem to va race very well, but is it qualifying? Is it a little bit more luck? Is it 
I mean, circumstances, because today was excellent. That, that was a heck of a race by you. Um, yeah, I think, I, I don't think it's my, like, my driving that is the problem qualifying. I think it's just that we just didn't find the right way to warm up the tires. Uh, so even, even with a good lap, I would be half a second off uh, the pole. So I think that was the biggest issue. Um, so I hope we can keep it up for the next races. Yeah, well, great haul of points for you. Uh, that, again, going to move you forward in the championship, and, and I look forward to seeing more of that because the battle at the end was really, really touch and go. Were you a little worried there? Maybe that you might get contact with, uh, with Kevin, but it was pretty, pretty close in the hairpin on the exit. Um, yeah, I was just taking it easy. I didn't want to risk anything. Um, I knew he might try to pass me and stuff, but my goal was to just finish the race. And if the two in front crashes are out, that's great. But I, I don't like, I didn't want to race at all. Fair enough. I mean, it nearly worked out. That was a close call and you, you held on very well. Congratulations on, uh, on the podium. Thank you. And that's, I mean, there you go. That's, that's our three top finishers, Paul, but it's so hard to narrow it down and speak to just them because there was so much action that went on deeper in the field this time as well. Absolutely. I mean, we were always going to see that, that front three just stay in position, look after the cars, look after the tires, and uh, really push on. But I want to bring Connery into this because, Connery, I mean, there was drama all the way through the field. I mean, what were you seeing out there that we were maybe missing out slightly? Well, there was a lot of radio chat going on, especially with Daniel Lafuente and Josh Thompson. They were very, very frustrated about the positions they were stuck in. And I think I remember Seb Hawkins, who's the, basically the team boss of the both of them, saying the only way this is going to end is in tears. And of course, there was a bit of a smash ahead of them. So it's uh, kind of... Uh, uh, kind of a little bit of a Nostradamus move there, just uh, predicting what's going to happen in the future. But uh, that's just the case uh, further back in the pack there. It's always a little bit of trouble. Um, but maybe that's just the nature of the track. Maybe once we once we go to the next circuit, maybe, maybe things will be a little bit better for those mid-pack guys and they'll have a more ample opportunity to make their way forward that isn't trying to move people out of the way. But uh, yeah, a lot of frustrated drivers further down in the mid-pack. But of course, it's good to see uh, another different winner, at least as far as a feature race is concerned, with Mitchell De Young uh, taking the race swing and a great podium for Thomas Tatler, his first. Absolutely, and Matt, I mean, this track always delivers, but we're uh, we're heading out next time, in two weeks' time, to Spa-Francorchamps. I mean, yeah, you know, these cars just love that circuit. They devour it. They do, and these drivers love that circuit and can devour it. Personally, I'm horrible around it, but what a, I mean, what a legendary track. We get back into some elevation, drafting again, massive straightaway that's that's going to be a huge factor. Tires definitely as well because you've got a mix of high speed and some some low speed, the bus stop, corner one. Uh, it's got a mix of everything. So uh, yeah, it's going to be a ton of fun to get there um, and, and more of a European track. I think probably if you had to look statistically across all sims, not just iRacing, it's probably the most lapped track uh, on, on in sim history. So these guys definitely will be on their game. Absolutely. So we can look forward to that then in two weeks' time. We'll head to this place, the magnificent Spa Francorchamps. March the 13th, set it in your calendars because you will not want to miss those races here in the Porsche Tag Heuer Esport Super Cup. But it was a drama filled day here today in Montreal. It was a tremendous win for Joshua Rogers in the sprint race with Mitchell De Young able to take the victory here in the feature race from everybody here on the broadcast from matt trevitt from uh, connery maddock and also from will vincent for the uh, countdown and the all-stars show it's goodbye here and good night